your businesses continue to thrive. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for being here today. We could not accommodate everyone that wanted to be here to talk matters economics. So if you have friends out there, we are live. We are going live shortly on Facebook, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn, again on matters economics. Karibuni sana, I hope everyone has had breakfast. With us today, we'll have a panel having a conversation on matters economics. We also have key guests joining us today. We have Dr. Koech from the Central Bank of Kenya. We have Dr. Ndi, who's the chairman of the President's Economic Council. We are waiting for him to join. We do have Dr. Ngugi in the house from Kipra. We do have Kwame Owino from IEA. And we have Job Wanjohe from KAM. We also do have our own internal chief economist, our acting group director, Global Markets, Rafael Lagoon, will be managing our panel today, our great conversation again on matters economics as we wind down 2023 and look into 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to all the customers, the special customers we can see today from manufacturing, from trade, from telcos, from energy, from religious institutions, from circles, from agriculture, and our NCBA team and oxygen team that manages our PR, Karibuni Sana, members of the fourth estate. You're very welcome. Thank you for continued support to NCBA and to ensure the things that we do internally are also helpful to the public at large. Ladies and gentlemen, today's conversation has been one in the waiting. The last two economic forums have been held virtually, so it's really a pleasure to be having this conversation in person, and you would get the chance to ask your questions, to the esteemed panel, make sure you have your questions ready. I understand a number of customers have already shared their requests. And we also do have media with some of the conversations and questions that are coming through from the public at large. We do have the right uh, experts in the room, the right economic policy makers, the right people who advocate for the economy, the people that advise the government, and the people that make sure we are well versed on matters economics, both locally, regionally, and also globally. Karibuni sana. Ladies and gentlemen, we have nine more minutes. We start at eight. I know we are all economists and run things on time. I can see my live team ready to roll. <laughs> I am waiting for one of our key guest speakers so we can start. Ladies and gentlemen, let me give a few insights on our guests today. We have Dr. Susan Koech from the Central Bank of Kenya, our Deputy Governor, a career banker that has also worked in both the public and private sector. We are really honored for her to be here today. Dr. David Ndi, a Rhodes Scholar, an economist, a public intellectual, a well-known columnist covering matters economics, Kwame, CEO of IEA, Job Wanjohi, and Dr. Rose Ngugi. Ladies and gentlemen, our group managing director, Mr. John Kashora, is also present here today. We have members of the executive committee from NCBA. We have Louisa, our chief of staff and group director strategy. We have Charles Omondi, Corporate Banking. We have Raphael Agung. We have Tyrus, 
uh, Group Director Retail Banking. Karibuni Sana. Karibu John. Members of the Fourth Estate, Karibuni, Citizen Nation, K24, KBC, The Standard Group, Abojani, our different business bloggers, our esteemed team from NCBA who put this lovely event together. Karibuni Sana. Ladies and gentlemen, it's still not yet 8 a.m. <laughs> is it? It is 8.04. <laughs> I know matters economics need to be matters that run on time. So we are going to kick off. We are already live. For any of your friends who want to join us today, we are live on Facebook. We are live on YouTube. And we are live on LinkedIn. Ladies and gentlemen, as we await our final guest in the room today, let me recognize our different customers who are accompanied by our different NCBA colleagues. We have manufacturing, construction, real estate customers. We have the telco, we have energy, we have trade and logistics, we have the public sector, we have non-banking institutions, religious institutions, legal, practitioners, health, and education. We also have members from the diplomatic missions. We have NGOs, we have agriculture, we have circles, and I can see Sankul is here. Where is Sankul? Hello. And maybe as we wait, I would like to introduce our NCBA team that takes great care of all our customers here. So if I can ask our NCBA team to be upstanding so we can see you today. We have Sankul, Sally, Nelly. Anthony, NCBA team, thank you. Thank you for the journey, Rehab. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you. Thank you to this NCBA wonderful team for bringing together our customers. I know would not have managed to get everyone in this room. I think uh, up to this morning, we had requests of more than a thousand people that wanted to attend today's event. We can only take 300 people in today's event. So thank you to this team, Asanteni Sana. I was actually asked to, to teach the crowd the NCBA club. We have an NCBA club because as go-getters, we always identify ourselves with some features. And so I'll test it and follow me and follow my cue. If you're an NCBA, you know how we do it. So let's appreciate our NCBA team, our esteemed customers, our esteemed guests. And this is how the club goes. One more time. And one more time. 
That is the NCBA way. The bank that says, go for it. So every time we have people that do well, that go for it, that wake up to live their dreams, that strive for more, that are fearless, that want to make a difference in the world, we do appreciate them. Thank you very much for your patience. We are almost starting. We are about to start. And thank you for joining our event this morning. With us today, we have Dr. Koech from CBK, our Deputy Governor. We have Dr. David Ndi from the Presidential Economic Council. We have Job Wanjohi from KAM. We have Kwame Owino from IEA. And we have Dr. Rose Nguge from Kipra. These are some of the guests and panelists that we'll have for our conversation today on matters economics. Ladies and gentlemen, we are winding down 2023. The theme for today is a divergence and an outlook on 2024 matters economics. The things that we we'll look out for, the insights that will drive our business and the changes that we should expect in the next 18 months. Thank you very much for joining our occasion. We do appreciate the NCBA team that's also in the house. We have our group managing director and CEO, Mr. John Gashora, in the house. We have Charles Omondi, our group director, corporate banking. We have Raphael, who's our chief economist and group director, global markets. We have Tyras Muithiga, our group director, retail banking. We have Tim Amitaj, our group director, risk and controls. We have Louisa Wandaboa, our chief of staff and group director strategy. We have members of the leadership team from NCBA. We have NCBA team and Oxygen from PR Communications. And my name is Nelly Wainaina, group director marketing, communication and citizenship. I will take you through today's program. Our program will run for about two hours. We should be closing by about 10.30. So for today, we'll start with remarks from group director Group Managing Director, sorry, John. We'll then have some insights from our Chief Economist, Raphael. We'll then go to our group speakers for today. That's Dr. Ndi and Dr. Koech. And then we'll go to our panel conversation. A slight change in today's program. We will take questions immediately after the guest speakers because I know and we've anticipated enough questions coming from the customers, from media, from the public, as we are also going live. And so we'll take Q&A first, and the Q&A will be addressed by Mr. John Gashora, Dr. Ndi, Dr. Koet, and Raphael. And then we'll get into a panel conversation today. Ask as many questions as you can. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your forum. This is your opportunity to understand the future in the next 18 months, both locally and also from a global level. We will then close and we'll have a photo op and media engagements and interviews, and then we can finalize by 10.30. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you spent time last night reading Matters Economics and English because I'm told economists are one of the best when it comes to English and analytics. And ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start. Ladies and gentlemen, it's about time. It's about time. Karibuni sana. The Deputy Governor 
of Central Bank, Dr. Susan Coet, the chairperson, the President's Council of Economics, and the advisor, Dr. David Ndi, Karibu Sa, our distinguished panelists, Dr. Ngugi, Mr. Wanjohi, and Mr. Kwame Karibuni. Esteemed customers, our invited guests, my NCBA colleagues, our executive committee at NCBA, members of the Fourth Estate Media, Karibuni, all protocols observed, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are ready to start. Welcome to NCBA's Eighth Economic Forum, DAB 2024 Macroeconomic Outlook, the Divergence of Economies and Sectors. As a key player in the financial sector, NCBA has provided thought leadership with this forum for the last eight years. And for our customers today, we are looking at an opportunity for you to interact with the various subject matter experts on matters economics in the private and public sector. An outlook of the economy and what lies ahead for 2024 and the insights that will affect your businesses next year. So as I mentioned, the last two sessions have been virtual and it's really a pleasure for us to be meeting physically in person. I know some of you are here to meet Dr. Ndi, which is amazing, he's an amazing person. But more importantly, in the room, we have customers from different sectors, as I've mentioned. We have customers from manufacturing, from trade, from religious institutions, diplomatic missions, telcos, energy, transport, trade, agriculture, circles, NGOs, Karibuni Sana. And to steer today's conversation, we have our esteemed panelists who will be introduced much later. And then we have our NCBA group team. And without much further ado, because we've spent enough time with the intros, I'll invite our group managing director and CEO and the host of today's forum, Mr. John Gashora, to make his remarks. Haribu, sir. The Deputy Governor, Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Susan Koech, the Chairperson, the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Dr. David D., all our distinguished panelists, invited guests, my NCBA colleagues, members of the four that stayed present, or protocols observed, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to connect with you this morning. Um, on this plot platform where we meet to exchange ideas on macroeconomic environment that we find ourselves navigating in these volatile times and help shape the right public policies and debates for the respective prosperity of all our people. Public and private sector participation in the conduct of our affairs as a nation is a key invocation of a founding document, the Constitution, and as a good corporate citizen, we at NCBA take this responsibility quite seriously. For those who are active on X, formerly known as Twitter, you know that our friend David D has been engaging a lot of us there, often insulting us, David D, I must say. But in a good-natured way. So today you have a chance to ask him directly what you want to ask him on Twitter. So today, please do engage and ask him lots of questions. Also, I know that the central bank has also been attacked severely, for no good reason, because they do a fantastic job. That is why a very good friend, Dr. Susan Koech, one of the best speakers of our time, will be here. So please do engage her, and please ask her those hard questions, like where are the dollars? Stop asking the banks. Although I know she will blame us again. <laughs> uh, so anyway, through the NCB Economic Forum, we will continue to bring together the best brains in our country to help us think through and solve some of the most difficult and intractable problems of our time. So thank you all again, really, for being here with us. As Nelly has said, it will be very interactive. 
we'll hear from these great speakers, also great panelists, but please do ask all the questions that you might have. Today's forum's theme is 2024 Macroeconomic Outlook, Divergence Across Economies and Sectors. This theme could not be more opportune, as I'm aware we are all at the tail end of finalizing our respective business plans for 2024. We could use a little more presence and discernment regarding tomorrow's operating environment from some of the analysts and forecast, our panelists, sorry, analysis and forecast that our panelists and speakers will be delving into shortly. Turning to the economy quickly, indeed, any objective accounting will record projected growth in 2023 output at anywhere between 4.8 to 5.2%. Indeed, according to our in house forecast as NCBA, we now expect the 2023 GDP growth to close at about 4.9%, powered primarily by welcome resilience in services and a reversal of fortunes in agriculture output, especially in quarter one of this year. However, this accounting also reveals biting and unprecedented cost of living pressures, ravaging household balance sheets, and daily threatening to push back a good number of our people into wrenching poverty. Headline inflation, although within band, remains a little elevated at 6.9% in October and averaging about 8% year to date. Expectedly thus, tough conversations continue to dominate most of our public debates. In fact, economic uncertainty headlines many news editorials these days. Here, for instance, is the nation newspaper editorial just this past Thursday. And I quote, there is more pain ahead for Kenyans as prices and fees for basic services continue to skyrocket. Life has become increasingly difficult for the majority of low-income earners as the government strives to boost revenue collection to meet its obligations. Life under the first year of President Ruto's administration has been tough with a raft of steep tax increases. This has angered the people, with the opposition decrying the high cost of living. End of quote. This was from the Nation newspaper this past Thursday. And if you don't believe the ex-president that Magazette uh, Nyakufanyanini, Nyakufungajama, at least let's remember that one quote. End of quote. Evidently, in important respects, it would seem that the gulf between lived experience at the household and enterprise level and reporting national account numbers appears to have widened in the recent past. In America, they say that what Wall Street experiencing has not made its way onto Main Street. In Kenya, the question is, why is it that Upper Hill, a financial center, feels so different than the estates? I think that's the question of debate today. How come the headline numbers are so good, yet all of us, when we strip back to our households, we're all feeling the pain? I think that is the question everybody is trying to understand, and hopefully today we'll get to understand that better. But in all frankliness, this divergence is not entirely new. It goes back to the weaknesses in national income accounting frameworks that are not entirely insignificant, given the prominence some of these data and numbers take as we craft our public policies. However, this age-old debate aside, there's no question that despite the biting cost of living challenge, significant progress continues to be made. And that's perhaps where you see the numbers looking very good. Since taking office slightly over a year ago, the government has continued to make the necessary adjustments that will be required to restore more durable macroeconomic stability 
which remains a key prerequisite for long-term growth. And I think here I should quote that Mr. D has reminded us that we have had to make some tough choices. And these tough choices don't look like, don't, are not felt on the street fast enough, but eventually they will. They are necessary for bringing in the required macroeconomic um, progress. On the monetary policy side, for instance, the Monetary Policy Committee has sustained a steady and significant adjustment of the policy rate and the necessary transmission mechanisms have continued to replace the yield curve quite significantly throughout this year. I must say that's one of the most commendable and tough decisions that the CBK has made uh, this year, to move quickly to make those tough decisions on the monetary side, on raising interest rates. We have also seen the administration roll out significant fiscal adjustments with an, with an outlined multi-step fiscal consolidation path anchored at a target deficit of 3% of GDP and a medium-term revenue strategy necessary to achieve this. Again, when you hear the president and the central bank talk about fiscal consolidation, it sounds very easy to do. But let me remind you, that is a, one of the hardest things for any government to do. And this government has committed to do that to reduce our deficit to 3%. And I want to quote back a statement that was made by the late U.S. President Ronald Reagan back in 1964. I go that far back. I'm not that old. It's on YouTube. Uh, back in 1964. And he said that the truth about governments is governments know how to create they do not know how to destroy. So governments, you always create. If one agency is not working, they don't finish that agency, they create another one. And they have a board. And they have people working there. If it's not working, they create another one. And so you end up having all these. So the bigger, so governments know how to get big. They don't know how to get small. But we have a government that has committed to reduce deficit. That means government that is committed to actually looking at some things and making reforms that sometimes would destroy what is not necessary. So that's also very commendable. On the real sector, we continue to see the operationalization of the bottom-up economic transformation agenda with its key emphasis on agricultural transformation, micro, small, and medium enterprise economy, healthcare, housing and settlement, and the digital superhighway, as well as the creative industry. Admittedly, some of these adjustments on the monetary and fiscal side were always going to be hard, even if necessary. To be sure, the musings from the editorial I just captioned broadly demonstrates this fact, that whatever actions that are being taken are going to be hard. And obviously the editorial was really reflecting what we feel on the states, as opposed to how we feel, as I said, in Upper Hill, the financial district. With these growth positive adjustments, we now expect, as I said before, GDP to grow at 4.9% in 2023, and indeed maintain the current trends into 2024. So looking ahead, our internal forecast projects GDP to grow by about 5.1% in 2024. That's very positive. Whereas this is in contrast to about 6.1%, 5.7%, and 7% respectively that we project for Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwanda. Kenyan enterprises with operations in the greater East African community markets, this roundly strong economic performance across these markets should be good news for potential 2024 outcomes. More specifically for Kenya, though we expect the projected growth to come with pronounced divergence across the different economic sectors, we expect the services sector to register good performance in 2024. However, broad economic strain could see some pockets of the sector grow below their pre-COVID levels. Agricultural output, on the other hand, 
is likely to expand by about 5% according to our projections. To be sure, we expect agri-export flows, including coffee, tea, and horticultural crops, to remain within their long-term average trend uh, that we have seen before. Overall, therefore, we remain quite optimistic on 2024 prospects. The risks to this outlook, of course, are many, but largely stem from an even more uncertain external environment. If indeed there is divergence between what Upper Hill and the states are feeling, I think the global div divergence is even bigger. Notably, global long-term interest rates have shot up significantly. The 10-year US treasuries are already around 5% a multi-year high, while events in the Middle East, as we know, have cast more shadow over energy markets, as we were told by our CS for Energy, and outlook more broadly. This rate outlook is likely to remain elevated, given last week's pronouncements from the Fed Reserve of the United States. Indeed, the new higher for longer remains so far the accepted wisdom of global monetary policy today, and I hope we'll hear a bit more from our uh, DG uh, this, this morning on this, on this issue. Even this, it is fair to say that notable divergence on either side of the Atlantic remains. While the IMF now projects faster growth in the US, the broader Eurozone is forecast to contract in this forecasting horizon. So as I alluded to already, these vicious and divergences from the external and domestic fronts do raise significant challenges to the promise of the much needed macroeconomic stability. So with that, allow me to pause and invite our chief economist, NCB chief economist, Mr. Rafael Lagoon, to amplify some of these vicious that I just talked about as we see them and set the context for some of the thoughts of our distinguished speakers and panelists will be walking us through. Uh, welcome, Rafa. Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, John, for that uh, wonderful overview. Uh, those who've been in the room longer than 30 minutes are aware that we've sort of flipped the program. Uh, so with that, I'm mindful that uh, you need to hear our distinguished speakers. David is particularly innovating, but even uh, Dr. Susan Koech, I'm sure all of you want to listen to that. So I will not waste any time. Uh, as a matter of fact, when your boss summarizes your entire presentation in seven minutes, as John has done, all you can do is say, I hope you've heard what has been said. But what I'll do is, uh, John has attempted a very delicate uh, sort of argument there, for those of you who are keenly watching which is to try and locate uh, the current state of angst and public outcry regarding the stage of the business cycle and the adjustments that uh, the government is making both on the fiscal side and the monetary policy side, and then situate that quite ably with what we are seeing in terms of overall headline trends, which is, as is already said, we project uh, to close 2023 at 4.9%, and then slightly go higher to 5.1% for 2024. Uh, that gulf that is explained, of course, is goes back to just how uh, national income accounting work, frameworks work, uh, but the positivity in it, and this is important, uh, should not be understated, which is uh, four years, almost four years post-pandemic, uh, with a significant disruption, uh, a record 4.5 or 5.5 on average growth uh, is fairly decent. And if you tie in the fact that the policies currently being pursued by the administration are trying to uh, sort of tear us up uh, for the next stage of our progress, uh, you then will agree that uh, uh, that's important to note from a point of positivity. And it's difficult to do that given the current conversation. Uh, the final point that I think is important, as I sort of said, the context for both the uh, keynote address and David's remarks, uh, is that yes, there are obvious 
difficulties that uh, have to be confronted. A lot of them are stemming from business cycle adjustments, as I said, on the fiscal side and monetary policy side. And then it's left us with probably four key variables that you need to pay attention to. You have uh, the ethics uh, sort of concerns on the one hand, uh, but on the back of that, actually underlying that is actually uh, a fiscal sort of um, realignment, if you will, uh, especially in view of uh, the June 2024 Eurobond mat uh, maturity. And I think uh, David has uh, repeatedly engaged the public as he should uh, on this matter. So yes, we are cautiously op uh, uh, optimistic about uh, both this year, but, but more, more importantly, 2024. And we do think that uh, the conversation before us today uh, will help us bridge the gulf between that sort of lived reality, which is the cost of living crisis that's being uh, sort of addressed, and then, of course, uh, the head numbers. So I'll stop there and ask John to come back and, and, and continue with the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. You made it very, very quick. Did I say that much? But uh, thank you. So um, our next speaker uh, will delve a bit in some of the things that we have said, and I'm sure answer some of your key questions. So as you come up, uh, the next speaker, one of the questions I'll pose to you is exactly what I said. Why does Wall Street feel so different from Main Street? Why does Upper Hill feel so different from the States? Dr. David D. is currently serving as the chair of the Presidential Council of Economic Advisors. Dr. D. is an economist, author, public intellectual, and well-known columnist covering economic development and governance issues. Previously, he served as the chief strategist of the National Super Alliance. He has also had a long career in civil society, going back to when he co-founded the Institute of Economic Affairs at just 26 years old in 1994. The Institute became Kenya's first independent policy think tank. A renowned scholar and an astute researcher, Dr. Ndi also, an SNR fellow, has written vastly and has been cited numerous times by fellow scholars. He's a Rhodes Scholar on top of being an SNR fellow with a PhD and a master's degree in economics from the University of Oxford, and another master's degree from the University of Nairobi, where he also pursued his undergraduate degree. He is also a very active member of Twitter. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. David D. Good morning. Very well. Good morning, Mr. Muriuki. Hi. It's a good friend I haven't seen for a long time. Let me start with an anecdote. Many years ago, um, a business I was advising, uh, one of the prominent businesses and very successful business in the country, I think it was post-1997 election, and I went to one of those sessions, which some of you have been, where you're looking at uh, strategy and uh, external environment and macro issues. And these people, these business, they had very aggressive numbers. We had just come out of uh, an election. Uh, there had been a bit of violence. It was Moy's last term. If you recall, it was then big conversation about whether you know, Moy would retire or whether he might seek a third term as many of his colleagues were, were doing. Uh, the fundamentals, the previous sort of five, six years had fairly pro good trajectory and therefore people wanted to be optimistic. So we had a conversation and uh, I managed to persuade them, uh, the, the, the leadership, that uh, they needed to hunker down um, and uh, have a more 
sort of conservative uh, scenario. Um, things actually went south for a considerable period. People remember 97 to 2002 was actually one of the most difficult times. And every time we met thereafter, uh, the CEO who has since retired uh, kept reminding people that that decision is what saved the business. Many of their colleagues did not survive. So bad news is not always bad news. Uh, if you need to, you need to plan based on the best possible. <laughs> Uh, and actually, very often, uh, what you want um, is to survive difficult times, not necessarily to thrive in good times. You can thrive in good times, that's easy. But surviving difficult times is a much more, and you need to have the mindset to do that. So um, you can tell I'm prefacing <laughs> some very tough. I have three uh, slides that uh, I will speak to. Uh, just to foreground um, a few more comments about where we are, why we're there, it's very important, and uh, how perhaps uh, things might uh, unfold. The first slide on the left has our budget balance, and the next slide has the current account balance, two very critical um, no, don't go back, stay there for a while. Uh, very critical, I'm going to stay there for a little while. And it goes back, you can see the uh, current account, the budget balance goes back to about 2003. It's very important always to follow long-term trends. The other one goes up from 2000 to, 20, to now, 2022. And the budget balance uh, projects forward up to about 2027. The blue bar, they're not as visible over there, uh, is the overall deficit. The green bar uh, is the primary surplus, which is your budget balance excluding interest payments. And uh, what you can see, if you look at the shape of those two things, is that they are probably the same thing. Yeah, you see the same trajectory. You start with the, in the early Kibaki years. Uh, you've got small macro imbalances and uh, very and some positive balances, and then we go into this episode over the last decade of very very large imbalances. Now, which is what is driving what? Of course, the thing which is driving. Uh, the current account is the budget deficit. What's going on? we going on is the thing that I have talked about for the last one debate, one decade, which is debt financed public infrastructure investment led growth. Um, that, of course, uh, what you see is reflected in the current account. I think, again, back to some national accounting, which sometimes people don't appreciate, is that uh, when you go to China and you borrow money, you actually don't borrow money. Uh, if you're building a railway, what you are borrowing is actually capital goods. Yeah? You don't have, you don't manufacture your own capital goods, so what you're really looking for is foreign exchange to finance the imports of capital goods, steel, rail, all sorts of things, locomotives. So obviously that will appear in your imports, therefore you're expanding the current account. Uh, it will appear as a big sort of uh, trade deficit. And on the financing account, it will appear as an inflow of capital, it actually no capital comes in, it's actually only steel, cement, uh, and all sorts of things. But from an accounting perspective, we put that as capital inputs. So you build the railway. But no money came in, you know. You went to a supermarket in China and filled your trolley 
yeah swiped your your debit card came back put all your sort of stuff and then you told you can pay later yeah so when time comes to pay uh, how do you pay you actually now have to pay from your salary so uh, all you, as you are enjoying your flat screen TV and all manner of things, you don't remember at some point uh, the grace period is going to expire. And then one day you look at your pay slip and wow, you know, a third of it is missing. Yeah. So that's what happens. But also, because you're doing that so heavily, you now have to also look how do you finance your other um, imports. So uh, not only do you do borrow from to those capital goods, you actually go to the markets because you have access to the markets and you also borrow from the markets now, similarly to finance. So all that is driving a very huge uh, um, um, uh, budget uh, deficit, 8% per year for a couple of years. And then, of course, that is reflected in your current account. So what you see is that not only are you soon, the, the interest payments start catching up with you. So I think uh, in 2014, when uh, this, uh, the Jubilee administration came in, interest payments were about 12 percent of uh, revenue i think now the number is about something like 28 to 30 percent one part close approaching a third of course you assume when you go to the market in particular that uh, you will always be able to refinance your debt but markets are fickle yeah and times change. At the time, I think when you had all this cheap money that you were able to go and borrow because of QE, bond salesmen were everywhere. They were telling you, we went to the market with the first euro bond that is now maturing. Uh, we said we wanted to do a debut issue of $500 million for benchmarking uh, so that we can diversify our sources. By the time we were done, the issue, we had borrowed $2.8 billion. First, we borrowed $2.2 billion, and then the market told us, hey, the bond is still oversubscribed. We were to learn a while later that we left the tap open and tapped another $800 million, so $2.8 billion. I won't go into the other stories. Uh, but there you are. At some point... Uh, by the time you are coming to repay, which is about now, markets have changed. They've closed. Uh, so how to refinance, of course, is a very big part of the question. But something else has happened. China also, which uh, was on this uh, foray of trying to externalize its, uh, its, its, its recession by exporting uh, its uh, capital goods. That's why they're sort of financing you to build railways and all sorts of construction things. Uh, China also runs into difficulties, both with the Belt and Road and also with uh, its domestic financial system. So China stops lending. So all of a sudden, first China is lending Africa outflows of about $20 billion a year. I think last year it was $2 billion. In our case, we are having inflows of capital goods coming from China, all this infrastructure that uh, uh, is sustaining the economy, and then China stops, so you're not getting the economic activity, but you're also paying. So we move from net inflows of $1 billion from China to net outflows of $1 billion from one year to the next. So you got to flip, you can go to the market, and that's where you find yourself now. So that's the uh, macro story of the situation that, uh, that we, we find, and which we knew we were going to find ourselves at. We wrote about it in our manifesto, but that part is seldom read. Uh, now, 
That's the macro story. Now, the real economy story, which is the question that John asked me, is in the next slide. Now, I've not been able to update this because it's a lot harder work, but we're working on it. But this story tells you how that is, what that is doing to, to, to the composition of, of output of GDP. So it's a four-year moving average. So it's dragging 24, includes all the way from 2008 uh, for stability purposes. So the dot is your GDP growth rate, uh, which is uh, roughly around uh, 6%, 6, 5 point something percent, that's 5. So the growth rate isn't changing very much. Yeah, economy is growing at 5, 5.5% over the entire period. But if you look at the composition, there are some bars at the bottom, which are dark blue, which are increasing. And that is government consumption and government investment, government. So between 2012 and 2017, uh, in that first uh, term of the Jubilee administration, when you have 6% growth, the government is contributing one and a half percentage points. So that would be about a quarter. By 2017, when you have 6% uh, of something growth, government is consuming two point something, 2.5. So government share of growth has grown to 40%. And that's uh, like uh, five, six years ago. So if you look at it now, I suspect government contribution will be about half or thereabouts. So it's government that's driving. So the growth, the, the growth number up there is not changing. So, but only government. So what is government replacing? Government is crowding out production. Yeah. And government is crowding out production with debt financed aggregate demand, both domestic. Of course, it's borrowing domestically, so it's crowding out the private sector. It's borrowing abroad, and it's beginning to cause a resource shift, very fundamental resource shifts. Those who are familiar with the, with the economics of natural resources will be familiar with the phenomena called the Dutch disease, because most of what the government spends on uh, goes into what you call non-tradable sector, like construction. So the only game in town is supplying government. Uh, if somebody has a truck uh, and uh, they were previously transporting farm produce, uh, now they can transport construction material for government project at twice the price. Uh, so that price goes up, so the people in farm produce cannot afford, so uh, produce is becoming more expensive. And of course, uh, in the world market, you do not have, you cannot push prices, so you're becoming, you're losing competitiveness. So the share of government in GDP is increasing vis-a-vis -vis the productive sector, and of course, the productive sector. Uh, also includes exports because government doesn't produce exports. The other thing that does is that it is a production sector that pays taxes. So although GDP, the denominator is expanding, the share of the tax paying part of GDP is falling because government can't tax itself. And in fact, when you're talking about big public projects, like uh, the big roads and the railway and all of those, the contractors are actually tax exempt because the financing is considered aid. Yeah? So the, then you will see that the tax share of GP is falling uh, because the economy is becoming very government centric. And of course, that has distributional consequences. Uh, up in Upper Hill, uh, you are able to extract uh, more interest from government. Yeah. Uh, 
people who are connected to government, tenderpreneurs, uh, having a field day, I'm driving down Kenyatta Avenue or Moy Avenue. All I can see is black SUVs, uh, you know, one after another. And I'm telling you people, the day of reckoning is coming, but you're not listening. When you see that, uh, you know what is coming. It's, it's very, very familiar. Uh, that's a Dutch disease problem. Property prices are going up. Uh, that means that the shift between tradables and untradable pricing, uh, your real exchange is appreciating or becoming less competitive. A time of reckoning is coming, but we are having a great party. So who's listening? Yeah. So that is the, the huge distribution of consequences. Who's paying for these? People in the production sector. They're the ones who are paying for these. Because you've shifted resources, we are not supporting farmers uh, because we are now, all this urban economy is booming. Um, it's consuming, we are eating debt, we, stop pro we are reducing food production within a very short time. If you look at our numbers, uh, our food imports actually triple. So that also is undermining uh your 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 external balance quite significantly because you're now importing quite a lot of uh, of your basic food i think the last time i looked uh that number had gone up to something like three three billion dollars a year of, of of basic food imports and of course so that when you have global price shocks on food Okay, those are transmitted very directly to households. Yeah. Uh, households who have not benefited from the construction boom. And in fact, the economy has been, the production economy has been undermined. So your farmers, your rural economy, your market has been taken away. But now you have to buy imported food. So where is the disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street? It's right there. It's in the distributional uh, consequences uh, of this phenomena. And of course, at some point, the music stops. And yeah, so when the music stops, uh, all these things begin to, to unravel all at once. In the last slide, uh, is shows that this phenomena is not peculiar to Kenya. It's actually Africa-wide. This is a similar growth decomposition like the one I have shown, but this is done from by the IMF uh, using um, sort of a much different database. Uh, uh, Penn World Tables, people who do research will be familiar with it, uh, which tries to correct for some of the problems that you're talking about national accounting. But, Again, it's a composition of, uh, of expenditure. The, the thing you want to look at is the, this side is Africa, that side is other uh, emerging and developing economies, and it's over a period of time. You see what's happening to Africa, 2000 to 2014, uh, growth about 5%, but it's mostly coming from um, investment, physical capital. Same thing we have been talking about. Yeah, infrastructure building. Your growth is, is actually coming out of infrastructure building. There's a bit of uh, productivity growth. I want us to focus on that orange bar, the productivity growth. Uh, you then have that kind of collapse. Uh, uh, for a while, it goes up, but you see that uh, now the, you, it's, you can no longer financing. Countries are running into debt distress you can no longer finance the infrastructure, so your growth comes down. You cannot sustain in debt finance infrastructure, uh, especially when that infrastructure probably has undermined the, the production sector, so you cannot even sweat your infrastructure because you have undermined production. If you look at other countries, what you see is that uh, even though uh, there is a, a CAPEX-led growth 
it is also translating to the orange bar, which is what you want, which is productivity. So growth is more driven by productivity. Therefore, the infrastructure there, whatever they are putting in CapEx, is paying off in terms of uh, productivity. In our case, uh, you are doing in infrastructure uh, in Africa, but you are not getting the, the dividend in terms of productivity. So there's something structurally about the way we are going about infrastructure. And I have a paper about that. If you look at it, look it up. It's published by the Carnegie Endowment, uh, trying to explain why you observe that our infrastructure doesn't have the same impact on productivity as in other parts of the world. So, People say that I'm long on theory and short on solutions. But if you don't know what is ailing you, you can't solve it. So why, why is this? What is happening? Why doesn't have the government have solutions? So you can't, then you have to understand. So what are we trying to do and what it's it? We say we have to rebalance the economy back to production. So we have to shift resources back to the productive economy. We have to slow down on infrastructure and sweat the infrastructure we have already built. Yeah? At any rate, we don't have the headroom, the fiscal headroom, to keep borrowing to finance the same growth model. That has to change. So even what you must do, there are some infrastructure, for example, if you're going to increase your production, this country is still predominantly agricultural, so you're going to have to put in infrastructure that supports agriculture like irrigation. But even if you have to do that, you probably try as much as possible that you get that out of, you take that into the private off balance sheet, of the government balance sheet. And if you read our strategy, that's what it says. That infrastructure which we must do, you must, we try and do as much of it off balance. And we've done that. We've actually come up with a structure for doing that for water and irrigation. Uh, if you go to water website, you will see a pipeline of about 30 projects that we have put out for PPP uh, using the water purchasing agreement instrument we have developed, very much similar to the one we use in the power sector. We are trying to do similar things with ports, airports, the infrastructure that you must have to support uh, your, your economy. What we cannot do more of is more expressways. That we don't need more of. So, while you are doing this, there will be distribution of consequences. And there are adjustment costs and sometimes coordination failures. Because as you get out of the, uh, the, 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 the construction, public infrastructure economy, and you try and get back into the production economy, then there will be a withdrawal symptom. And that's what you're hearing. You're hearing a huge withdrawal symptom because the, the production economy hasn't quite picked up, but fiscally you cannot afford to, be, to continue feeding this beast. Because that takes you over the cliff. That's what our good friends in Ghana did. New government got, or oh, in Sri Lanka as well. New government gets elected, but it doesn't have the uh, will or does it to bite the bullet because you want to remain popular. You, you insist on implementing your, 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 your promises. And of course, most electoral promises are linked to public spending. So you start implementing your electoral process. And in fact, the Ghana government went further and said, you know, we need to create an enabling environment for business. So they reduce taxes and increase expenditure. And you already have a debt problem and a fiscal problem. Well, 
where do you think you're gonna end up? Yeah, you're gonna end up uh, where they have ended up. So the imperatives are quite clear, but they are at transitional costs. We believe that what you're doing is working. To just give you an illustration, uh, the first thing we had to do absolutely was to deal with the food crisis. And of course, in Kenya, food is almost synonymous with maize. Uh, 200 shillings a packet, uh, that in itself has uh, other social consequences. So we said, we're going to take money out of petroleum subsidies, which we should not have been doing in the first place, uh, to finance subsidies for those SUVs I talked about, um, and put it in fertilizer. In fact, uh, the amount we put in fertilizer is what we were spending on oil subsidies for one month about six, seven billion shillings. The return on that, two seasons, 15 million extra bags of maize. We've actually managed to get the yield up, if the numbers I'm getting are correct, uh, from eight to 12 bags an acre. Also got some increase in acreage. That's the biggest single year increase, I think, in maize uh, yield increase we've had in, in our history, if I'm not wrong. But we'll, we have to validate the numbers. I think it's probably a bit more than I expected, but you never know. So those things, we, that, that's obviously fairly low-hanging fruit. I can go into details. Of, if you look at our budget and the way we have operationalizing plan, we have 10 uh, high-priority agricultural value chains that we think are what we need to do that realignment. Why are we focusing on agriculture besides food? It's because agriculture doesn't need new investment. We have the farmers, they have the livestock, they know how to do it. All they need is actually working capital. So there's a fairly huge runway that you can get uh, yourself back into the production economy. But of course, in the meantime, you still have to see how you also expand your revenue base. Because if you don't expand your revenue base, that fiscal uh, thing will keep uh, bothering you uh, for a long time. So I think that's, that's the gist of what we are trying to do. Um, I hope it explains some of the things that uh, sometimes may seem inexplicable. Um, but um, we believe it's working. We can see some, some, some green shoots here and there. If you pay attention uh, to the, particularly to the agricultural sector, uh, but also the fact that people are feeling the pain means that the adjustment is happening. Thank you very much. Explain me to say something funny, don't you? Are you feeling the pain? Are you feeling the pain? Yeah, that's what we're being asked. Are you feeling the pain? Um, so I think uh, that was, I think you've answered my question extremely well. Extremely well. The question I'd asked, if you remember, why does the state feel different from Upper Hill? Or why does Upper, Upper Hill, the financial district, feel so different from the estates? And I think the, I listen and I summarize to one problem. Yeah, David D, what you're saying, the problem we have in this country is called Serikari's idea. It's called what? Serikari's idea. All of us asking for Serikari to come build roads. We're all asking for Serikari to come and build railways, isn't it? We're all asking for Serikari to give us contracts. Yeah? So Serikari's idea is a problem. That's what he has told us, that government spending, not just revenue uh, collection, but government spending has crowded out the private sector. We have all built businesses. Today we are building businesses to supply to government. I think that's what he said. We are all building business to supply to government. And it's true. You see Joakadis out there saying, government, please come buy stools for me. Come buy tables for me, because I'm building these wonderful tables for your offices. Sarikari's idea. Day of reckoning is coming, he told us. 
It's a great party, so nobody is willing to stop it. That's what David D. has told us. I think the summary again, Sarikari's idea, we are debt economy, or as we say in banking, we have become the LPO economy, isn't it? Everybody comes with a government LPO to be funded. Isn't that true, uh, Mr. Mundi? You have a government LPO, you have to fund me. So we become a debt world government LPO economy. We have to take the tough decisions which have rebalanced the economy back to productive economy, slow capital formation to adjust to productivity. And as we do so, there will be distributional consequences. And the consequences are being felt in the estates today. So thank you, Dr. D, for that. And so can you join me giving him the, the NCBA club? So let's go. One, two, and one more time. And one last time. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. D. He'll be back here for Q&A for those of you who have lots of questions. Now, our next speaker, I have to be very careful because she's also my boss, um, is my boss. She's one of the best bankers you'll ever meet, uh, one of the smartest people um, that Kenya has had. Wonderful to have her today. Dr. Susan Koech is the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. She was a career banker who switched lanes and took on various public roles, serving as principal secretary in the state departments for wildlife, East African community, and regional development. Dr. Susan Koech possesses expensive, ex extensive experience in the conduct of public service and corporate experience. During her tenure as a principal secretary, Dr. Koech is credited with establishing and negotiating for trade and investment country positions at the regional level and strengthening bilateral relations and engagements across the East African community. Moreover, she was instrumental in accelerating the progress on the establishment of the East African Monetary Union as a way of strengthening intra-EAC trade and investments. At the State Department for Wildlife, she developed innovative, sustainable models to achieve best practices in wildlife conservation. Before taking on public office, she was a banker. That's her only scene in her career. She was a banker working as head of the Nairobi region of the Kenya Commercial Bank. She holds a doctorate in business management and a master's degree in business administration from Moy University, where she also pursued an undergraduate degree. Dr. Koech takes on the job of being a central banker at a time when we all know this is the hardest job to have in the world today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Koech. Uh, the group CEO of NCBA uh, Bank, the chairperson Economic Council, uh, the invited panelists this morning, invited guests who include my sister Esther Koimet. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning once again. I think it's a difficult task uh, speaking after Professor Andy, um, but I'll be able to give you the central bank perspective. IKC gave you the, his perspective and also the perspective from the Economic Council. I'm deeply honored to be invited to participate 
in this very important and timely NCBA Economic Forum. I also greatly appreciate the relevance of the theme on which I have been requested to speak, the 2024 Macroeconomic Outlook, Divergences Across Economies and Sectors. This theme is a topical not only for us in Kenya, but also the whole world, ranging from the Sub-Saharan Africa region to the Middle East, Europe, as well as Latin America. As you are aware, the global economy has witnessed multiple shocks in the recent past, including the COVID-19 pandemic, adverse effects of climate change on agricultural production, high inflation, and escalation of geopolitical tensions, particularly the war in Ukraine and the current happenings in the Middle East. Indeed, the spillover effects of these shocks have been felt in most economies, including Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to provide some highlights of the recent global and domestic economic developments and the outlook from the central bank perspective. As you may be aware, a weaker global growth is expected in 2023 and 2024 compared to the outcomes of 2022. The IMF World Economic Outlook released in October 2023 shows that global growth is expected to decelerate from 3.5% in 2022 to 3.0% in 2023 and 2.9% 2 in 2024 with significant divergences across major economies. This outlook largely reflects reduced economic activity in advanced economies, particularly in the Euro area and China amid increased uncertainty regarding persistent inflationary pressures, increased borrowing costs following monetary policy tightening and continuing geopolitical tensions. Growth in China has slowed down due to prolonged weaknesses in the property sector. Growth in Sub-Saharan Africa is projected to decline from 4.0 uh, percent in 2022 to 3.3 percent in 2023 on account of elevated inflationary pressures and rising borrowing costs before picking up to 4.0 percent in 2024. While the general softening of performance is uniform across the globe, with a few exceptions like Kenya, there are different unique factors undermining performance in individual economies. For example, growth in Nigeria is projected to decline due to security issues in the oil sector, while growth in South Africa is expected to decline in 2023 due to the effects of power shortages. Despite the global uncertainties, Kenya's growth has remained strong and is expected to remain above the global and South Sub-Saharan Africa averages in 2023 and 2024, pointing to the resilience and diversified nature of the economy. The economy grew by 4.8% in 2022, well above the Sub-Saharan region average growth of 4.0% and the global average of 3.5%. The CBK expects the economy to grow by 5.5%. Please note that number. And don't take the number that John gave you earlier. <laughs> that was from NCBA. We expect the economy to grow by 5.5% in 2023 and close to 6.0% in 2024, supported by a rebound in agriculture sector resilience of the services sector and impact of government measures aimed at stimulating growth in priority sectors of the economy, including in agriculture and manufacturing sectors. The main resilience um, of the Kenyan economy uh, comes from the following. One, the economy is well diversified. 
away from the traditional agriculture sector, which accounts for about 22% of annual GDP, with the service sector and MSMEs playing an increasing role demonstrating the presence of a dynamic private sector. This has enabled the economy to weather the multiple shocks faced, particularly in recent years. B, Kenyan exports are well diversified in terms of products and destination, with Africa remaining the main export destination for about 40% of the exports. The implementation of Africa continental free trade area is expected to spur increased intra-African trade and therefore enhance demand for exports of Kenyan products. As C, the policy measures currently being pursued by the government in aim to continue providing um, a strong foundation for macroeconomic stability and long-term growth. Coordination between monetary and physical policies continues to support stability in the economy and financial markets. The monetary policy stance continue to focus on achieving and maintaining price stability and the government is committed to fiscal consolidation over the medium term to stabilize public debt. The lower domestic financing needs of the government will enable the expanded lending to the private sector by the banking sector. On the inflation front, emerging and frontier markets like Kenya have faced sustained inflationary pressures and elevated global risks. The CBK has tightened monetary policy by raising the central bank rate cumulatively by 350 basis points since May 2022 to 10.50%. Although inflation was largely driven by supply side factors, the CBK actions aimed at mitigating the second round effect and ensuring inflation expectations are well angered. Overall inflation has since declined from a peak of 9.6% in October 2022 um, um, to 6.9% um, in October 2023, which is within our target range. The decline reflects the impact of monetary policy measures adopted by CBK, easing food prices attributed to favorable weather conditions, and the government measures to zero rate key food imports and enhance food production through subsidy on fertilizer prices. On, on fertilizer prices, food inflation is to 7.8% in October 2023 from a peak of 15.8% in October 2022. Fuel inflation remained elevated at 14.8% in October 2023 uh, due to recent increases in global oil prices and removal on, of unsustainable subsidies. Cooking gas prices have been declining since July 2023, following the zero rating of VAT on the commodity. Non-food, non-fuel inflation has also declined from the peak of 4.4% in February 2023 to 3.6% as a result of the impact of monetary policy measures. We expect inflation to remain within the target range going forward as we also remain vigilant of the impact of higher fuel prices due to volatility in the international oil prices space. Turning to the external sector, the current account deficit has narrowed and was estimated at 3.8% of GDP in the 12 months to September 2023. It is projected at 4.1% of GDP in uh, as at end of uh, 2023, mainly supported by resilient diaspora remittance and lower imports. Export of goods declined 2.0% in the 12 months to September 2023, reflecting uh, declines in receipts from horticulture, animal and vegetable oils, and miscellaneous manufacturers. 
However, receipts from exports of tea, manufactured goods, and chemicals increased in the period. Imports of goods declined by 13.2% in the 12 months to September 2023 from a growth of 16.4% in a similar period in 2022, mainly reflecting lower imports of infrastructure-related equipment due to completed projects, manufactured goods, and chemicals. Diaspora remittance have remained strong. The remittance um, totaled $4.142 billion in, in the 12 months to uh, September 2023 and were 3.5% higher compared to a similar period in 2022. Tourist receipts remain resilient and continue to support uh, services balance. Tourist arrivals improved by 3.4% in the eight months to August 2023 and were 3.3% higher compared to a similar period in 2022. This was largely uh, because of the government efforts in one, ensuring that we have more conferences. The African Climate Summit, for instance, in, uh, led to more uh, dignitaries coming in. We've also seen a lot of um, head of state and head of governments coming to our country, and whenever they come, they will always will come with other dignitaries. In addition, the government has been able to open more air spaces, and this has actually led to improved uh, tourists com coming into our, our country. The use of foreign exchange reserve have remained uh, adequate. On the banking sector, I would like to acknowledge the important role that banks have continued to play in the Kenyan economy, particularly in mobilizing savings and undertaking financial intermediation. Indeed, there is a scope for banks to play an even bigger role to achieve the country's development aspirations and better living standards for the population, and more so in the areas of financial inclusion. I would particularly like to take the opportunity to applaud the banks that have been supporting the MSMEs, as these are the vehicles for future growth and employment in the economy. We have also seen that our Kenyan local banks have continued to expand into the region, and that just shows that we indeed are the financial hub and our uh, financial sector has remained solid and it has remained uh, stable. And indeed, on the issues of return on assets, our Kenyan banks always rate higher than the sub-Saharan African uh, peers. I'm happy to report that the banking sector remains stable and resilient. The sector's capital adequacy ratio, ratio was 18.6%, while the liquidity ratio stood at 49.3% in September 2023 which were above the statutory limits of 14.5% and 20.0% respectively. The ratio of cross non-performing uh, loans uh, to cross loans stood at 15.0% in September 2023 compared to 13.7% in September 2022. However, the banks have continued to make adequate provisions for the non-performing loans. Growth in private sector credit stood at 12.2 percent in September 2023 and 12.6 percent in August 2023. Strong credit growth was observed in manufacturing uh, sector, that is 22.0 percent, transport and communication sector, 18.5 percent, trade, 7.1 percent, and consumer durables, 10.5 percent. We expect growth in private sector credit to remain resilient with the continued rollout of innovative credit products targeted at micro, small, and medium enterprises. Regarding the fiscal side, the implementation of the financial year 23-24 government budget continues to reinforce the fiscal consolidation objectives. The financial year 22-23 budget deficit declined to 5.6% of 
of GDP from 6.2% of GDP in financial year 2021-2022. A narrower budget de deficit of 5.4% of GDP is expected for financial year 2023-2024 and 3.6% of GDP in financial year 2025-2026, which demonstrates the government's commitment to fiscal consolidation and to address public debt vulnerabilities. The CBK will continue to work closely with stakeholders to implement reforms that will enhance efficiency in financial markets, strengthen the banking sector, and enhance access to finance. As you are aware, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the CBK has recently rolled out various reforms and initiatives that include, one, a new monetary policy implementation framework that was rolled out in August 2023 to enhance monetary policy transmission. The framework is based on inflation targeting and introduces an interest rate corridor around the CBR set at plus or minus 250 basis points. Monetary policy operations are now aimed at ensuring the interbank rate as an operating target closely tracks the CBR. Additionally, to improve access to the discount window, the applicable rates was reduced to 400 basis points above CBR. These measures have resulted in increased activity in the interbank and reduced interbank rate spreads. Secondly, the CBK implemented the Dow CSD on July 31st, 2023 to enhance efficiency in investment in government securities. The system is versatile and transformative, enabling an anywhere, anytime investment in treasury bills and treasury bonds. Many investors, including the Kenya's diaspora, are already benefiting from the upgraded system. The Dow CSD will also improve the functioning of the interbank market by facilitating collateralized lending amongst commercial banks thus reducing segmentation in the interbank market. Kenyans from all walks of life, including um, those of us who are here today, are encouraged to invest in government securities by taking advantage of the easy to use upgraded online system. Thank you so much for listening to me and thank you again, NCBA, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, DG, for those uh, remarks in the, uh, the true fashion of a, of a central banker. You gave us a lot of numbers. I hope you took, you took notes, huh? a lot of very good numbers there. But I think the, the, the point that I took from all that was that, one, uh, you're more optimistic about growth than we are. <laughs> that was one, yeah? You... Your projection is 5.5% for 2023 and 6% for 2024. And I think at the end of the day, if you have to choose who to believe, the central bank has a lot more data than NCBA. Okay? I think that's, 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 a, good, that's a good reminder. I think that gives us a, a, a very positive note for, for this morning. I, I do want to, to, to say, and I say your job is difficult. And I think you heard the DG talk about the changes that are made to the CBR rate. One, raising rates by 350 basis points in a span of a year, that's significant and a very difficult decision for central banks all across the world, especially when the inflation pressures, the inflationary pressures we have seen, as the DG has told us, was actually supply side led. That's a very difficult decision. For most economists, at least the little economics I studied, 
and I can see my friend Kwame here before he uh, corrects me, I was told that inflation is typically demand driven. And therefore, when you attack it through monetary policy, you attack the demand side. But this is period we have seen inflation being supply side driven, which is usually very difficult uh, to, to attack. And hence, the reason why we have not seen the transmission be as quickly as we'd have wanted to see. But thanks, thankfully, we have seen inflation come down, as the DG has said, to 6.8. The last time we touched 6.8 was May of 2022. So we are back over a year, um, more than a year ago, to where inflation was. I think also two, two very important things that I, that I picked that perhaps people have not understood well was the changes that were made to the monetary policy, the ones you talked about. Um, it sounds more to say that the new monetary policy framework was put in place. But let me tell you what it means uh, for you as a customer and for us as bankers is that every time the MPC would meet and they would announce what the CBR is, yeah? The only time we used CBR as banks was when it goes up, we raise interest rates, isn't it? But if you asked us what does it actually mean, we could not explain. What this framework has done is give actual meaning to what CBR is, the central bank rate. In the sense, like all over the world, the right monetary policy is that the Fed rate, in this case our CBR, should have direct consequence to funding for banks. And that's exactly what this new framework has done, is to link it directly with how we fund ourselves as banks. And therefore, if we raise your rates, it's actually because it reflects the true cost of money to banks. So thanks for that. I think that was a great, a great move. And now the DAO CSD, as you talked about it, another big move by the central bank, and again, you talked about it as being able to, to allow banks to do collateral, to use it as collateral across uh, banks. But beyond that, actually, is to use it is for customers to use your bonds, your government investments as collateral with banks, as true collateral with banks. It will have the same value as you would give for land and property, because now we can actually perfect that security. So thank you very much and for the work that you have done. You did not talk about the things you have done on the FX market. Uh, you have been at the forefront of uh, fixing this problem. Um, but I think we'll have a chance to comment on that in the next uh, session, which I shall call now Nelly to come and lead us into it. But before we do, obviously we must give the DG the NCBA club. So let's go one, two, and one more time, and one last time. Over to you, Nelly. Amazing, amazing. We've heard from really great speakers today. And uh, because we want to free some of their time, I believe Dr. Koech will be leaving uh, as in 30 minutes, so we'd like to take advantage of, of you and uh, hear from the customers. We've heard from the experts. It would be a great time to now hear from our esteemed guests today on the questions you have. And so before we go into the panel, what we'll do is have a Q&A. So I'm going to ask uh, our CEO, John, uh, back to stage. I'll also ask Dr. Koech back to stage. I will ask Dr. David D back to stage. And I'll also have Raphael from our NCBA team on stage so we can start the Q&A. Q&A, 20 minutes, I believe will be enough, but we'll spend as much time as possible listening to you. Really, a room full of economic experts is a positive signal, emphasizing the need for continued dialogue and a showcase of the efforts being made by both the private and the public sector to unlock barriers of economic growth and ensure our country continues to prosper and show resilience amidst the economic challenges. Welcome to our Q&A team. Uh, if you can help me get the podium off. Thank you. We have two mics going round. And so if you have a question, please raise your hand and then we'll start with the Q&A. Thank you.
Well, thanks uh, and morning again. Uh, thank you, uh, DG, for that uh, those wonderful remarks. Uh, of course, David, uh, for that ex uh, eloquent exposure of where we are at. Um, I want to give the next 30 minutes to all of you uh, to interact with our two speakers. Uh, but just to tee it up, um, I'll probably start with David. So, uh, David, you obviously make a very eloquent case for the history of why, where we are and why. And I definitely agree that uh, in understanding the why, we can probably project how we move forward. And you offered a few thoughts on that. Um, you do have bragging rights, because I think you've been calling this out for quite a while. So I'm mindful of that. I'll give you credit for that. Um, but I want to leave that behind, because uh, before you are allocators of capital, so some of that sort of shift that you're talking to in terms of just the structure of the economy, uh, these are very key players in, in those decisions. And as they plan for 2024, uh, it's important that uh, they hear from you, at least from the executive, on uh, how potentially they could catalyze uh, some of those policy reforms that I think you're pursuing uh, at the executive. So is it that the toolkit, as we understand it, is constrained, and so we just have to wait for the full impact of the pill, as you say, the pain, or do you see, especially in addition to just the counter-cyclical responses that we see, do you see anything that could be a quick sort of um, address to some of the, especially the cost of living side? Uh, I know you've done a bit of work on the uh, subsidy bit, especially for food, and so that's uh, palliative in that sense. Uh, but for business decision makers, uh, how would you, would you want them to think about uh, the policy terrain, uh, say, a short term, in the next 12 months, uh, more directly? Thank you very much. I think uh, it is not that complicated. John Gashora put it very well. You, I was talking about debt financed kind of economy. From your side, you say you call it LPO economy. That has to go. Okay? So if you are fine, the first uh, thing that this implies that you have to start rethinking about uh, financing government facing customers and look at consumer facing customers. Yeah, if you think that, where is this adjustment going to go? You follow through with it. As it is, uh, you notice in the supplementary, we cut the budget very significantly. It is very difficult to tell people in government, there is no money. You tell them and they look at you. What do you mean there is no money? There is no money. Okay. So even if we wanted, we could not sustain that economy. Lazy banking is going to have to take a back seat. Uh, what we see as the recovery model is that we are seeing it. Obviously, uh, what the cost of living crisis has done is uh, reduce discretionary incomes of consumers very considerably. Uh, let's just talk about maize. Uh, maize food for, is on average uh, about half of household expenditures. Okay? Um, for poorer households, it's over 60%. Okay? So, if the cost of food goes up by a significant amount, food is an absolute necessity that crowds out other discretionary spending. If you reverse the process so that food becomes cheaper, then of course there's more money for more discretionary spending. 
the numbers I was looking at were follow very closely for the mid-level brands that uh, average households consume of Miss Mill that is now down to 140 shillings. For the lower income and uh, parts of Western Kenya where they buy whole grain, that is down to 100 to 110 shillings back to pre-crisis prices. Uh, a whole lot of other things, other commodities you think are one of the places. So we expect a double whammy is that you reduce the cost of living on the food side and that also increases consumer spending uh, because you increase the discretionary spending on uh, on other on other things. So that's that's the kind of trajectory. The other thing is that there are some sectors of agriculture where we have very high low hanging fruit uh, in terms of production and productivity growth potential. Let me give you an example. Uh, we have the largest we are the largest milk producers in Africa by far probably more than about double everyone, the next person, which is South Africa. And that's because we have a lot of animals. We have about three and a half million to four million dairy animals had, and that excludes the pastoralist cattle, which is another 15 million animals. But the reason why, that's why we have a lot of milk. Uh, we are also the highest per, per capita consumers of milk on the continent. That's not surprising, because we drink a lot of milk tea. Um, so, but the actual productivity output per cow is very low. It's only about three kg per day. Okay, so that's about three, two, I mean, three, three, three kilos times 200 uh, is uh, what? 600 kilos per lactation. Uh, you're talking about potential 4,000 kilos per lactation, three to 4,000 kilos. So the potential to expand uh, milk is is very very high because if you know if you feed your animals well one day to the next you get higher output and we are seeing that already with very minor interventions if you then improve husbandry you get another two another kilo if you change your genetics which uh, you can do within uh, 18 months to 24 uh, months you get two three more kilos so we think we can double our milk productivity in the next three to four years. Uh, if we do that, Africa is a milk deficit uh, region. We import a lot of milk. So one of the sectors we are targeting to emerge as a major export sector for Kenya is dairy. And we think that can happen fairly quickly. In fact, we think it is possible to overtake even tea and horticulture. Uh, in the in the medium term, simple example also from the livestock sector. If you go into uh, global statistics about hides and skins production, we are in the top ten hides and skins producers in the world because we have, as I said, lots of animals. We slaughter three million cows a year, plus fifteen million sheep and goats. That is about eighteen million hides and skins. If you go to the next level, leather. You don't see us at all. If you get to products, we are not even uh, anywhere in there. You see the little leather and zero product. Why? Because for various policy reasons and various other factors, our recovery of those hides and skin is below 20%. So you have a lot of raw material out there that you are wasting, which is potentially very valuable. And that's a sector we think we can do very, very quickly. Uh, we're working on uh, an infrastructure to improve hide recovery. It's very complex because it's a very low value product with very high transaction cost at the recovery level. You know, if you to go and collect a hide two kilometers away, which is only two, worth 200, 300 shillings, will cost you two, 300 shillings. So you need to figure out uh, how to solve those econ that economics. Uh, but if you can then recover those hides, that's an industry we can develop very, very quickly to an export industry. So, and that's what we can, I can systematically take you through all the sectors that we are looking at. But the gist of it, obviously, you can see as allocators of capital, what we hope we begin to see is your customers coming, up, coming to you with the business proposals which are around the uh, trade, you know, in actual commodities, other than expanding manufacturing, uh, business to consumer, business to business, and less business to government. 
I think that's that's what we hope that the, the, the that's where the, the model we think will go. Uh, thanks, David. I think you're, you're well guided. Uh, let me quickly come to your uh, audience. Yes, I'll take you. Um, I'll then take you. Uh, this side. And you. Let's see how much time we got. You go first. Thank you. Very good morning. I would like to indulge the, indulge the panel to put ideas outside the box, because what we have heard is very good. It's excellent, actually. But a uh, question to Dr. David. Actually, before I go to the question, a very small analogy. You see, I come from a My name is Stavros Constantino. I'm the finance director of Del Monte. I come from a country uh, called Cyprus. And it could be a good idea to look at some examples just like my country. You see, where Kenya is today, Cyprus was in 2012. We went through all this. We went bankrupt. So let's look at history. And let's look at examples. And let's see how we can mitigate against what has happened in the past so that it doesn't happen again. So what if the panel could think of, say, for example, privatization. It may be uh, devil's advocate, but if you have the state controlling entities which are heavily loss-making, well then, there are other solutions, aren't there? So perhaps, why not look into this kind of direction also? Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Travis. So we'll take... We'll take all the questions and then uh, the panel will respond uh, accordingly. Yes, introduce yourself and shoot. I thought I had you. Okay. Thank you. My name is Edmond. Uh, my question number one is uh, to indeed relating to production of listening to him i i was almost persuaded that the solution could be in enhancing production but then seeing what is happening it's kind of most policies that governments are adopting there is a sense in which it is straining access to capital especially to a typical kenyan producer so what is government doing in the intervening period to reverse that? My second question is more direct to the deputy governor. There is big fear now that government is likely to default on debt. A very direct question in terms of probabilistic thinking. How can you read that fear? What is the chance? that the government of Kenya is likely to default on its debt obligations. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those questions. I'll take the last one. Um, my name is Vincent Kimosop. I, I, my question is directed to Dr. David Ndi. I think just two questions, uh, Dr. Ndi. One is on production. I don't hear much uh, the place of uh, devolution uh, as you articulate the, uh, your, 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 the shift in government towards uh, our production. And then the second question is on public debt. Uh, my interest is, in the, uh, is on transparency, accountability, the way it's acquired, and even the possibility of doing really uh, an audit uh, to verify uh, whom do we owe beyond, uh, so, so because that, I made a public question, my humble submission. Well, thank you, thank you for those wonderful questions. Didi, I'll let you go first. I think there's a specific question on uh, how we confront the debt question into 2024 and a couple of us. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you for that question. I think if you look at overall, the government plans, especially on on fiscal consolidation, you will see a deliberate effort 
for the government to ensure that the public debt remains sustainable. And just to be as direct as you are on whether the GOK will default in its debt, and especially I think what has been worrying people is the June 2024 uh, euro bond. My answer is Kenya will never default. Our debt levels are sustainable. And the government has a plan that include first to manage the two billion uh, US dollar euro bond immediately before the end of this year by through a liability management. And we have been able to ensure that every time that a debt is supposed to be repaid, it is repaid because it's also in the government uh, budgetary plan. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, DG. I think that's quite cut and clear. Uh, provides us with all the assurance we need uh, as we end the year and probably move to an for David. Uh, lots of the questions are at you. One on productivity. I think there's a question about, I think, the hobby horse of viewers. <laughs> uh, transparency around public debt and, and, and what have you here. Yeah. Thank you. Let me, let me also reinforce what uh, Dr. Kocha said, Susan said, because we work together. Uh, the thing which is looming largest, and, and, and rightly so, is a 2024 euro bond, $2 billion due, markets are closed, it's the biggest uh, bond maturing in emerging markets, in front of, in Africa, in front of markets. So everybody asks this question there, what are we doing there? People also ask another question, why are we so uh, sort of proactive on, on the IMF program? Without the IMF program, we, we would probably default. Let's be honest. But if you listened to the, all the statements that have been made even by our people, Susan and others, the, finance, the CS Finance, the governor in Mar the IMF in Marrakesh and all of that, as of now, the 2024 euro bond is fully funded. The refinancing is fully funded. We know the markets are closed. Uh, there's an IMF mission in town uh, by the end. But by and large, the commitments we have, we have to come through with a couple of things. Uh, but the reason why we are doing that is because the IMF has facilities. It, is an, it can augment our program as of now up to $650 million that they've agreed to do. Uh, they can also give us access to something called an exceptional window uh, in the event. So we have access to the entire IMF balance sheet. So whatever else people think about the IMF, that's why it exists. Yeah, The IMF exists to help countries that are actually implementing the right policies to maintain global financial stability. And this euro board maturity is probably a global financial stability issue uh, for not just ours, but this whole thing. So uh, it is not just our problem. It, it can be a very significant problem. Uh, therefore, we have actually been very proactive in ensuring that uh, we secure all the funding uh, needed uh, and also to do some liability management, as you're saying, that's a strategy thing. We'll probably be doing either some early uh, sort of redemption or buyback or something like that by the end of the year. So as to improve the chances also of being able to go to the market uh, if the markets are open. Uh, I hope that uh, kind of settles that uh, question once and for all. There are, of course, people who are interested in creating uncertainty. Uh, because volatility is good for trading. Uh, so those ones will not stop. <laughs> now, uh, on privatization, I am, we, if you had followed, we have changed the privatization law. Since the privatization law that we have repealed was established, no privatization has happened. Because it was established actually to kind of forestall. It was a very, uh, so we have changed that so that we can do privatization. So we'll be doing quite a bit of privatization, but that 
privatization will not solve your immediate problem. It's a slow process. You have to prepare uh, companies uh, for listing. Uh, our law is such that only companies have been profitable. Can, you can put on the market. Others, you have to restructure, do all manner of things. But we're working on something which will probably be able to do uh, something quite innovative in the next couple of months. But privatization is not going to put cash in your pocket in six months. Yeah, It's sort of something, it's a structural sort of workout, but, but we are going to be uh, doing it. I think the question of mitigating default, we've talked about it. I don't know, sort of uh, the question of uh, providing capital, what are we doing? Um, given the financial situation, if you look at what has happened, uh, the kind of uh, liquidity crunch that you have imposes certain constraints. Uh, given the illustration, when we did the budget, the debt service, uh, if you look at the budget, the debt service uh, budgeted cost, uh, and you look at what it is now, based on interest rate and exchange rate movements, the amount of debt service cost for this financial year has gone up by 150 billion shillings already. And of course, if those prices continue moving, you are probably looking at a figure in the order of 200 billion that you hadn't plan planned for. That means you have to go to the market uh, to refinance. So your debt operations then impose very severe constraints. So the one thing that you cannot rely on at this point in time is channeling more capital to the private sector. Because you can't. More capital to the private sector. Hence, again, the reason why we chose to focus on agriculture as the kickstart sector, because agriculture is not very dependent on finance. A smallholder agriculture is not very dependent on finance. In fact, what farmers need more than anything else is access to inputs and also certain things. So that can actually kickstart your economy. As I said, 6 billion shillings is able to get you an extra 15 million bags of maize. If you try and put this in manufacturing, by the time you expand your plant and all manner of things and probably get your products to market, uh, you know, it's sort of two, three years down the road. Uh, so that is part. There's a logic on how you ask yourself, how do you navigate this uh, kind of situation? Uh, how do you sequence uh, things? Uh, so the sequencing you go for the sectors that don't require capital. Another, especially sectors that have excess capacity. Another sector which has had a lot of excess capacity, and the governor talked about it, tourism. So we're doing a lot of things that uh, people have been resisted doing in the past, primarily uh, to protect uh, Kenya Airways, like opening up the skies. Uh, opening up Mombasa for uh, other sort of foreign airlines and the sort of uh, budget travels. We've done that. I saw the industry saying that that's actually working because the tourism, hotel, the hotels have the rooms. Uh, they, all they need to do is to put uh, uh, people on, on those beds uh, and that, that stimulates also consumption. So you go for the sectors that don't require a uh, new capital investment, and then that then allows you to, to scale up to, uh, to other sectors. So there's a sequencing uh, that you need to think through how you navigate yourself through that. What's the role of devolution in the production? It may not be visible, but you probably could not do it. If you look at all the work we are doing on agriculture with smallholder agriculture, it has to be with the counties because agriculture service delivery is devolved. Uh, in fact, if you look at even the distribution of fertilizer, uh, we rely very heavily on the counties to do the last mile uh, distribution, the, the county governments. And uh, a lot of the work we're doing are mostly uh, new areas where we are introducing or trying to scale up production of, of uh, cotton, for example, edible oils, uh, all of that work we are doing with the counties because they are the ones who do the extension services. 
So counties are very at center. Again, if you follow, there's a project where we are doing um, industrial parks and aggregation parks so that you can improve the agricultural value chains. I think those we're also doing uh, jointly with the, with the counties. The question of who we owe public debt, I do not know why this question comes up. Sometimes I think we are just trying to be in denial. We build the railway. We know how much we owe the Chinese. True? <laughs> so most of the money that is causing us pain, pain, our pain points are China. Have we borrowed from China? Yes. Heavily? Yes. The other pain point is markets. Have we gone to the markets? Was it public? Yes. Are the euro bonds out there? Yes. Okay. The others are syndicated loans. Who do we owe them to? NCBA? <laughs> no. Oh, all manner of banks. They are syndicated by banks. They are made every time there's a syndication, there's an announcement. True? And then multilaterals, World Bank, IMF. So that even if there are some dodgy loans left, somewhere in the system, they possibly could not account more than 2-3% of the portfolio. And they are certainly not the ones that are causing us grief. The $2 billion euro bond is real. It was borrowed publicly in broad daylight. So I don't know what it is that we are thinking that we can audit debt and, and find some debts we can escape. There are no debts we can escape, at least not significant ones. Oh, thank you. Thank you, David. I am glad to hear you pay all our debts. <laughs> um, I understand, I had a few questions, but I understand one of our panelists, Dr. Rose Gogi, needs to leave very soon. And I also know the DG also needs to leave. So I was going to ask uh, Dr. Rose Gogi, who is the Executive Director of Kenya Institute of Public Policy and Research Analysis, KIPRA, and who serves the Secretary of the Board, a distinguished um, economist, to maybe react uh, to the conversation that's in the room and also any, any comments that she may have before uh, she leaves. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, you can also just take a, brief min a few minutes to, to give us a highlight of your just released on your report. Uh, it's very, it speaks very directly to the cost of living crisis that uh, David eloquently talked to. Thanks. Okay, th thanks very much. Um, First of all is uh, to thank N NCBA. Uh, I want to thank NCBA for inviting me uh, to this forum. Uh, thanks, MD. Uh, he's telling me to stand, but I have a back problem. <laughs> so I don't want to stand. I'll stand for two minutes and then sit down. Okay. So, um, all protocols observed. It's it's been a very uh, good moment listening to uh, David D. Because when David D. speaks, uh, then I think that uh, we know uh, who is driving us. Yeah, who is driving uh, the many minds that uh, we are seeing. Uh, but I want to I want to spend just a few minutes just to say that yes we have uh, what we call the Kenya Economic Report, uh, which we released uh, recently, and uh, the preparations for this uh, Kenya Economic Report started um, uh, before the new government came in, uh, and uh, our focus was actually on uh, cost of living, uh, which means that. Uh, we had already started uh, uh, thinking about uh, aspects of cost of living um, way back uh, because at that point uh, uh, the draw situation was very high and therefore uh, inflation was actually uh, starting to come out. Uh, I don't want to say about our, our uh, projections, whether they are the ones that we should take. But from our projections, I think we are much uh, optimistic than uh, Dave and D, than our DG, because our projections uh, at that point, uh, uh, we finished it this year, so our projection is about 5.7%. I think we are very optimistic. 
as far as the growth is concerned. And when I look at uh, the performance for the first quarter and the second quarter, we seem to be just there. Uh, and my hope is that uh, we close our fingers, uh, we get uh, the rains, the short rains, and the short rains don't turn out to be very uh, destructive. And if they are not destructive, we, we know that uh, we will be in good hands as far as the uh, agriculture uh, output is concerned. And I want to support the fact that, yes, agriculture is very key to this economy because uh, uh, during the COVID period, uh, we managed through a very difficult period because uh, our agriculture was performing very well. We had good rains, and despite uh, uh, the contraction in several uh, sectors, agriculture did not contract. But immediately after COVID, I think, thank God, uh, I think God saw that. Immediately after the crisis of the COVID, uh, contraction of agriculture started uh, because uh, uh, we got into a drought uh, situation. Um, Kenya inflation is all about uh, food inflation, and I just want to re-emphasize that. And uh, food inflation becomes uh, critical because uh, it's touching on the common mwananchi. The common mwananchi is spending a significant amount of her budget, his budget, on food. So any slight increase in a uh, uh, food budget uh, means that uh, the common mwananchi actually feels it. And that is what we are trying to bring out in that uh, report. The expectation is that uh, if you are able to increase income, uh, then you can actually uh, maintain uh, uh, the budget for, for the consumer. But we have seen, for example, uh, aspects of uh, uh, minimum wage. It's something that we've been having uh, uh, all along in Kenya. Uh, but again, uh, for quite some while, we've not been uh, uh, seeing in real value uh, that uh, minimum wage is uh, working to uh, protect uh, the real income uh, of the consumer. Uh, neither is it uh, uh, close to what you'd call the living wage. And because of that, uh, it makes it very difficult uh, when food prices are going up for the consumer to uh, manage uh, meeting their basic needs. And um, the expectation is that uh, uh, we have a good credit market and that anytime we have income, income shocks, uh, then the expectation is that uh, the income shocks uh, uh, we should see some, you know, some level of smoothening, uh, mainly from uh, uh, credit that you'd get from a uh, uh, banking sector. But a lot of the time uh, from our analysis is that uh, households rely on unsustainable networks. They rely on the groups, they rely on friends, they rely on family to get them out of uh, 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 income shocks. Um, and the question is, uh, what kind of products uh, we are providing uh, for the low-income earner to manage uh, their, um, their way of life when the shocks uh, uh, come in? So the other aspect that we looked at in this uh, um, analysis is the fact that uh, you could you could uh, smoothen the supply of food in the market if you are able to uh, manufacture process a lot of the excesses because uh, many at times when you have excesses our manufacturing uh, in Kenya is more agro processing and if we are able to process them it means that you can keep uh, the processed food uh, such that when uh, drought comes in, uh, you are able to supply uh, the same in the market. A significant proportion of the food that we consume 
actually is manufactured. And when cost of production goes up in the manufacturing, it also trickles in uh, to the consumer. So you have a consumer who is facing a um, uh, low supply because of drought, but also a consumer who is facing high cost uh, when high cost of manufacturing uh, is being uh, experienced. Um, and the other thing that we looked at is uh, you are in a situation where uh, we are asking or we are talking about transport, uh, we have shocks from outside, uh, we have oil prices going up, and they have implications as far as the transport uh, sector is concerned. And in a different analysis, we found that uh, you can do as much uh, even in enhancing uh, output from agricultural sector, uh, enhancing uh, production uh, with uh, uh, the incentives. But if the transport cost is also uh, going up, you might find that uh, the intended uh, impact may not necessarily uh, be uh, realized. But in addition to that is to say that there is a lot that the government has done and there's a lot that still needs to be done uh, to ensure that uh, our markets are working, uh, 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 whether from the agricultural side, from the manufacturing side, uh, from uh, the fin financial market side, uh, such that uh, uh, we find the consumer uh, being able to um, uh, benefit uh, from that market. So that's one thing as far as the, the Kenya economic report is concerned for 2023. But one of the things maybe I would uh, also want to uh, add is, um, I know Dr. Ndi has talked about uh, the debt, but sometimes we ask ourselves, how do we measure debt? We measure debt, debt as a ratio to GDP. We measure debt, debt as a ratio to revenue. We measure debt, debt as a ratio to export. So there is something at uh, the denominator that we sometimes uh, forget. Uh, and the key question to ask is, uh, uh, if we are to expand the GDP, it means that uh, uh, we may see, uh, seeing a growth in the denominator means that the ratio would also uh, come down. If we had uh, revenue collections, and that is again what he's saying, then we are uh, looking at a situation where, uh, again, we would see uh, the ratio coming down, but also giving us comfort that uh, you can repay uh, your loans. Exports, the same thing. So in some circumstances, we forget to, to look at uh, the denominator and then ask ourselves, what actions do we need to do in order to ensure that the debt which is up there is actually being able to uh, find us expanding our exports, uh, find us expanding our GDP, uh, find us actually facilitating uh, in a collection of revenue. And I like uh, also what uh, David is saying, the aspect of government expansion. Yes, uh, especially when we had uh, the COVID and uh, you go back to um, uh, the Economics 101, uh, where we look at the circular flow of, in of income, you'll always notice that uh, any time that uh, you, 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 you find that the circular flow of income is disturbed and uh, the flow is actually not there as it happened during the COVID, of course the government comes in and injects into the system as such that things don't collapse at the end of the day. And that's how uh, some of the debt that we are facing uh, we started with. But thank God uh, we have good partners like the IMF that was able to, uh, uh, to come in. But I wanted to also think about uh, an expanding government and an expanding informal sector. These are two things that are happening. And you ask yourself, uh, how then do we deal with the micro and small enterprises that have, uh, it's an economy that is growing heavily but at the same time, there is a lot of informality and there is a lot of challenges that the economy uh, faces, including the government also tapping into uh, the potential of taxation 
uh, that you'd get from the, uh, the informal uh, sector. So I want to ask David D, are we balancing our private sector, uh, which is uh, really uh, seemingly getting to be more informal because the capital that you're talking about is the capital for large farms, for the small farms. I know there's the Hustler Fund, but how do we actually balance that equation? So I want to leave it there with a question to David. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ngugi. Uh, David, I think you just take it on. Yeah, yeah sure. Thank you. I, 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 I'm happy to, re to react to Rose, not least because uh, we have been having this conversation probably longer than uh, any other two people in this room, given that we were college mates in economics. <laughs> so we have come uh, sort of a long way having this conversation. Uh, let me see. Let me start by connecting something you said about income shocks. How do households connect to income shocks? Uh, the hustler fund we have now is not the one we set out to, to, to do. When we went out, we wanted to set up a mechanism for SMEs and microenterprises to access capital. But when we went out to talk to people, they told us their biggest problem was something that they call Fuliza bondage. Most of them are now blacklisted in CRBs. Uh, I think there were 14 million blacklisted accounts. Uh, and they told us, please, the first thing we want you to do is get us out because now the only place that we can borrow money because we are blacklisted is from Shylocks in the marketplace and the Shylocks charge us 10% per day. So you take a thousand shillings, you buy your inventory. Uh, if you are a market woman and at the end of the day, you turn 1,100. So that was the first thing. So when we came to office, the first thing that we said, look, uh, we have to do something about. So we convened the fintechs and uh, the credit uh, reference bureaus and said we have to solve this problem. People then ask us, what can somebody do with 500 shillings as a business? And uh, all sorts of people, of course, who kind to do mockery about uh, these middle class types around these, what is 500 bob? You can't even buy you lunch. But 500 shillings is the difference between that informal sector person who has gone to work and it rained and they don't they didn't sell anything so they're going home without an income and there's a difference between whether their family eats or doesn't eat yeah? so the big thing that the hustler fund is doing is first of all a safety net because the people at that level do not distinguish their personal income and their business income. And the shocks are in there. They are very prone to not just macro shocks, but micro shocks in their daily lives are because their income is very erratic. Yeah. And one time we were having a conversation about it. And one person told us, you know, all the benefits, you, you missed it, the biggest benefit that we are benefiting from the Hustler Fund. And that is to say, I do not have to suffer the indignity of going to borrow 300 shillings from my neighbor or from somebody uh, in public. If I need 200 shillings, I do it, for, you know, in the, the things which go on down there that you, you may not you may not be familiar with. So that's one way of uh, providing an insurance uh, against those micro shocks that uh, millions of Kenyans uh, face every day, which is why I don't think any business which has ever been started in this country has been able to onboard 20 million customers in six months. I know it took, I worked with 
James Mwangi in Equity Bank, and it took us a little longer than that <laughs> to onboard, uh, or even Safaricom or everybody. So that's why the Hustler Fund was able to onboard 20 million customers in less than a year. Uh, let me turn to the story of uh, informal economy, semi formal economy, micro and small economy. And I'm going to link it to revenue. And uh, this big story about uh, punitive taxation and all manner of things. One of the first conversations we had came to government was with an agency called the Kenya Revenue Authority for obvious reasons. And the KRA was giving us their plan and their target. At that time, they are rolling out this thing called the ETR. And they had 180, 50,000 odd uh, VAT uh, businesses. Uh, registered businesses, and their target was to get that out to 200,000. I think many of you probably know that story better than I do about that gadget that they've been selling. We're trying to get them to stop selling it. Uh, it's very difficult. And we posed a question. And I actually am the one who posed that question. And I said, look, you are targeting 200,000 ETRs. Okay? But Safaricom has 800,000 teals and another 3 million people who have something they call Porsche La Biashara, which is a business wallet. So those are retail businesses mostly. All those should be VAT registered businesses generally. It has taken quite a while to get to the conversation that the other thing which has happened in the economy is not just informalization, but coming on the other side of the, what you call, might call the informal economy, or actually informal economy, is a digitization. That is a digitization that is creating a new economy because people are able to plug into uh, financial system is a plug and play economy which predisposes people to be able to do out there they call it gig economy all manner of things so there's been a convergence of digitization with our informal kind of self and uh, enterprise economy micro enterprise i prefer to call it micro enterprise not necessarily informal so that's where the economy has gone but the tax system has remained in the luddite past are uh, shaking down uh, the very old or the same people. And what we are trying to do is to shift the mindset, the shift the paradigm, and ask the KRA to go where the economy has gone. And it's not rocket science, because if you have the power to tell somebody to put a ETR on their cash register, a pay bill is a cash register you should be putting ETRs on those cash registers. So we did some numbers and uh, called Safaricom and asked the, the, the mobiles and asked how much turnover are you doing on these ETRs? KRA's estimate was that uh, the uh, revenue tax yield, what they are not collecting uh, is about, they are collecting 400, they've done some work with the IMF, thought they could get that up to 600. Even a few back of the envelopes calculations we did together, we came with a figure of about double that, 1.2 trillion shillings. And there are all sorts of other places. We've started doing that, for example, with the gambling, the betting, the betting uh, industry, and that has tripled revenues in less than a year. The base is small, but it demonstrates that it can be done. So obviously, if you are able to do that, what you, that's what we mean by expanding the tax base. We don't mean by going and shaking down. If obviously, if you're able to do that, it means that you could bring down the tax burden on the existing taxpayers. That's what Rose was calling expanding the denominator. And there are quite a number of other places. Personal income tax. If you look at the amount of personal income tax we collect vis-a-vis -vis what we collect on payroll tax, you can see there is probably a lot of uh, personal income tax out there, probably in the order of uh, another three, four hundred billion shillings that we are not collecting from people who should be paying personal income tax. So who does the burden fall on? It falls on to the unfortunate people who happen to be on payroll uh, because they cannot escape. 
Now those are, that, that, that is the reality out there. Um, and obviously that means that if we could actually, I believe that if we could collect all the consume, consumption taxes and probably the personal income tax out there, my ballpark is 1.5 trillion shillings, we could probably bring down corporate tax to something like 20% easily uh, without any sort of loss of revenue. So that's, that's, that's that part yeah. of, of that story. Good, good, good. Thanks, David. I think uh, so. I've been joined, uh, as was previously disclosed, uh, by Kwame uh, from the Institute of Economic Affairs and Job from the CAM. Uh, what I'll do is uh, because a lot has been said, traversing policy, a uh, little bit of those political economy questions of the day, and I'll sort of give them a blank check to react and, and just uh, give us their sense of the moment uh, and, of course, understanding that you come from business, any thoughts that they have for you. So Kwame, I'll go with you first. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thanks, David, for, for giving us a coherent narrative about how we got here. Um, and I think the, best, the impressive part for me was um, um, speaking about the, the choices that have been made with regard to, say, agriculture. I mean, no new money, at least not as much money is required, most of the agriculture that is practiced in Kenya, some of it is very labor intensive, and so the staff is in place and can be. Our view at the Institute of Economic Affairs, I think you'll tell me what part of this you agree with. Our view at the Institute of Economic Affairs is that um, COVID did a wicked thing in the sense that it uh, reduced the incomes. Or let, let me start with this. I think it's a good thing that you also focused on total factor productivity, which is basically the economist's language for uh, how efficiently any economy or any society mixes the factors of production to actually generate productivity, as opposed to simply just uh, building bridges and recording that as GDP. But one of the things that COVID did was uh, jobs uh, in certain sectors have not recovered in terms of numbers. Incomes did not grow much as well. And then comes the evil war um, in Eastern Europe. And then, of course, another knock-on effect was basically we have inflation because of oil prices and all that. Now, if that is true, the effect of that, obviously, is that as inflation was going up, and Rose reminded us that most of inflation is driven on this side by, by food prices and, of course, energy. <clears throat> uh, the choice then that was made to expand the supply of, of, of food by by investing in, in, or rather by providing subsidies for, for fertilizer is where I have, or we have a question. You see, while inflation affects all households, I mean, in terms of measured inflation tells you that yes, household food prices went up. Most houses spent the average 46% based on Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. Houses at the bottom of the income quintile, if you divide all houses, I mean, all, all households into five, had an inflation rate that was actually much, much higher because they spent most of their money on food and that food be, then became expensive, which you support, I mean, which you confirmed as well because most of that is in home, is, 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 uh, is uh, uh, most of that is, uh, most of their consumption is on food. Then government comes and decides that the way to do this is actually to, to expand supply. And so you give farmers, and the farmers in Kenya who tend to have surpluses to build tend to be large farmers. So they appropriate most of that government subsidy. They use that, sorry, they use that to, to have food. So we might have that bumper harvest. But I don't think for the people whose incomes were crushed by both COVID and inflation, much has changed. And that might have been part of the social costs that we saw while it was all attributed to political mobilization, but what some of the social costs that we saw at the middle of this year were related to the fact that people were really starving. I mean, rather, let me say people were really uh, suffering. My thinking then is, uh, David, it would have been a very modest proposal to actually consider whether some kind of direct cash transfer, again, the digital infrastructure would have allowed for this to happen very quickly. Why wasn't that option placed on the table? So that's question one. Question two is, I agree with you. I mean, it's not by agreeing with you as well that, I mean, without the IMF, um, I mean, uh, we'd be in Ghana's place because they too had the political rhetoric well, our pride would not allow us to do. 
But I've looked at the government of Kenya's undertakings, um, or rather um, agreement with the, with the IMF. And in our trying to, to check, provide a checklist, there are almost 35 or 38 things that government needs to do. Those too many? I mean, you're just chasing too many aggregates. And I'm worried for people like yourselves because you do a lot of, I'm sure your dashboard has a lot of things every, every day that you need to respond to. But here you are, I, I, I teach other things at the IMF. Every time they're in town, you guys have to go with them. Um, why? why? Why are we chasing too many uh, objectives? That they think? I know it's not common times, but why? And the unfortunate thing about that is when you're chasing 38 things, uh, invariably a few things will slip through people's fingers and all that. So I'm just wondering whether uh, in your office you have a prioritized list or do you think all 38 or so, that big, big number are really worth chasing? Thanks. Uh, thank you. What I'll do is, uh, David, if you don't mind, I'll let Job go next so that you can sort of just um, respond at the end. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty clear a lot of them are coming at you, the IMF program. You say the, the mission is in town, so... Uh, that's probably going to come back again. But Job, let me let you go now. Thank you so much, Rafael. Uh, one thing I have to state is that uh, for the manufacturing sector, uh, how we look at the economy today is that uh, the last one year, we have received various uh, balls. You try to dodge one, then you're hit by the other. Uh, whereby we are talking about like now the effective taxation rate uh, has gone high, uh, not only for the manufacturing sector, but also for other sectors that are playing in the economy. And Dr. D has said very, very well that we have to experience this pain. But as we experience this pain, uh, there is what we can uh, refer to what we call the other lava curve. There is only this much that you can extract from someone. Only this much they can extract from a corporation. Out of that, then you are taxing the businesses out of business. So instead of how it has been, uh, in the question of feeling like it's every alphabet of the 26 alphabets that a tax is being attached on, uh, which we feel like it has been a sledgehammer approach, a surgical approach would work better because uh, we are in a situation whereby in 2023 we have had even social crisis, and even Kwame has talked about this, whereby uh, families have broken down because of the crisis that they are going through. Uh, corporations have closed, or they have come even to our own associations and uh, making serious decisions of relocating. Uh, for instance, if you talk about the Finance Act 2023 and one of the levy that was put, uh, if I compare on some products that are imported for value addition in the country, you see there is an import tax differential between Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya of about 40-45%. Uh, if you're importing a raw material and intermediate product at a duty rate of 25%, uh, Uganda is getting a 0%, and we're in a custom minion. Uh, so when we go to the regional meetings, they are very happy, uh, saying, we love the decision that you're making in Kenya because they're bringing business to us. And so somehow we're feeling like the sledgehammer approach has not worked for the private sector. The surgical approach to get there because we are in full support of what the government is doing. And that's why now I need to reflect to the 2024. 2024, I agree on many macros that have been discussed here in terms of inflation, but from the manufacturing sector, we are looking at inflation from cost push inflation. We feel like it's likely to stand at this 6%, which is between the range that is uh, required, 2.5 to 7.5. But we can even go to lower or lower than 5 to 4, 3. If at all, we are not using the sledge, sledgehammer approach, the cost push inflation. We're talking about the debt uh, to GDP ratio. We like the fiscal consideration that is taking place today because the interest payment to almost a tune of 800 uh, billion care shillings is very high, and this is going to be reduced, and we like that fiscal consolidation. As far as the trade deficit, 2024, it's likely also to go to come low. As it comes low, it is not a question of that you have exported more. 
it is because we have reduced on importation because of availability of resources in our pocket. And so we need in 2024 to see how we can have an export drive. But again, if you look at now the export drive, the VAT refunds, this side, there's taxation that's taking place. This other side, the VAT, uh, VAT uh, refunds are not being processed. Sample, a quick sample survey that I carried, we carried this week, showed that about 70 companies are owed about 15 billion cash shillings, only 70 companies. And that shows that uh, their, their liquidity has, has really been depressed. This side, there is over taxation that is happening. This other side, refunds are not uh, taking place. Why can't we say, okay, we are going to tax. This other side, then we are going to give refunds back so that the private sector can be cautioned a little bit. So 2024, in terms of the macros, inflation is likely to come lower than where it was. GDP to debt ratio, trade deficit is going to, uh, to decrease. But it's a question of now looking at in a way that is more beneficial uh, to the private sector. Uh, if, if you look at uh, the, 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 the GDP composition, uh, whereby we talk about the government consumption, the investment, uh, we're talking about the government spending, and I like even what Dr. D, uh, D said, that uh, we, have been, uh, we have been servicing our economy or growing our GDP through in government in, in, uh, investment, and that is the expenditure. But if you look at the whole range of the GDP uh, calculation, we need to spur private sector consumption. And this is going to be spurred in 2024 if you're going to allow the private sector to have more and also to have economic retail effect. And now the institution, our association is working on the production, as Dr. D was saying. Uh, we have agriculture for industry. How we are going to source uh, the maize locally uh, from our farmers uh, through import substitution methods. Uh, how we are going to have the pyrethrum in 2024. Uh, be grown in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in uh, some of the counties that have better pyrethrum belt, like uh, Nakuru and many others. And talking about avocado and the importation of the same, having the, the, the right varieties. But as we do these, we must ensure that this value chain integration uh, in 2024 is competitive, is efficient, and we ensure that uh, the private sector is thriving without being constrained from both ends instead of putting it in a catch-22. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Job and, and Kwame Ralia. So David, I, I think, let me frame it for you. Um, there's a life curve question, and I'm conscious that you've, uh, in the past couple of days, had robust commentary on this. Um, are we taxing ourselves to death? That's the question. Uh, and especially from the private sector, certainly manufacturing point of view, I think uh, you've noted uh, Job's comments regarding that. So that's one. Uh, the program, the IMF program, um, are we chasing too many program targets? And from where you sit, uh, the administrative state being as complex as it is, is there a sense of the prioritization that you can probably talk to, that's the Kwame's point, and then uh, why wasn't cash transfers on the table uh, in, in sort of addressing the cost of living uh, crisis, and then anything you'd like to press out. I'm conscious that we've uh, gone way into our time, so uh, thank you all for your patience. I think it's very engaging, uh, but we're about to wrap up, so I'll let David have those, and then we can see if we have a minute just to close it. Thanks, David. Thank you. I hope I can be quick. Fertilizers versus cash transfer. One, not either or. Cash transfers have continued, particularly for the vulnerable. And let me say why fertilizer. It's been said here many times that uh, the food crunch is a supply side. So if you don't increase supply and you increase demand by putting cash out there, uh, what you're going to do is suck in more imports. Yeah. Um, so why did we do the fertilizer and why was it so important? First, in the previous season, because of the Ukraine war, the fertilizer prices, if you look at import price and landed price, it had shot up from 3,500 3, uh, to the farmer to 6,000. 
The consequences was a reduction in maize acreage by 200,000 acres. And the supply gap that we found of domestic production was 10 million bags. That was the brief we got when we came. We have a 10 million bag supply deficit. We are trying to buy maize everywhere. You recall some drama around some people going to look for maize in Zambia. So there was a supply, food supply problem. We ended up managing to buy some maize and beans from Ethiopia through some G2G arrangement. Okay. So getting farmers back into production was going to be very important. Otherwise, you get into the same cycle. So we are not dealing with the, uh, for the cost of living problem. We were actually dealing with a food security problem. Uh, if we looked at what the fertilizer prices were going to be, given that the supply crisis had continued, you know that it was one of the commodities identified as being most affected, and we realized it was going to be 7,000 shillings plus. So matters were going to get worse. And then you get into a vicious uh, food security crisis. Our fertilizer did not go to big farmers. On the contrary, one of the things we achieved, there has been attempts to register farmers and provide fertilizer subsidy using vouchers for many years. It hasn't worked. Uh, at most, various donor-funded programs have managed to register uh, about 500,000 farmers. We have registered 5 million farmers on that digital platform. And how did we do it? The old-fashioned way, instead of hiring consultants and all sorts of people, we give uh, tablets to every sub-chief, uh, give them some training, and uh, the sub-chiefs registered all their, their people. Uh, including geolocation, acreage, number of chickens, what you grew last season. So we have an incredible agricultural database that very few countries actually have. So using that, we also don't procure fertilizer. So what we've been able to do is aggregate orders. And in fact, the fertilizer subsidy we have done is only for maize surplus producing areas. That's the other thing. It was, you hear people saying, how come we didn't get, for the short, what we did the first short season, we looked at who's growing maize during the short season. So you do Eastern Kenya and Mount Kenya. Who grows maize during the uh, long rains? Then you do the Western Belt and you do it at the time that they grow maize. Hopefully, we are going to expand this so that we now are able to do other crops. We have actually uh, now able to pinpoint farmers and they tell even how much uh, acreage that they are growing. So what we saw is once we are able to do that, uh, the acreage went up again. Because what a farmer will do is that I have 10,000 shillings. I, could, I go to the agrovet. And I ask, how much is fertilizer? It's 6,000. I can only buy one bag. And therefore, I ask, how much can I plant with one bag? Either I plant too much with very little fertilizer, or I plant uh, the amount of land. So what we were doing is to ensure that farmers can actually plant as much acreage as they have uh, and would like to plant. Uh, during that season. So, but that did not mean that cash transfers. The pub, actually, I think the, the public cash transfer for vulnerable households is now in the order of 30 billion shillings. They're not, they're not the same. It was not either or. It was, not, it was actually a production intervention uh, to deal with the shock, both the drought recovery from drought as well as the impact of high uh, fertilizer prices uh from uh, so if you if the prices keep going up and you keep trying to give people money to buy to pay for the for the higher prices of food of course you can see what you do you yourself end up creating an inflationary spiral so you have to intervene on the supply side <laughs> imf too many structural benchmarks probably but the imf program is an imf program and we are in the imf program because we need credibility so that we can be able to raise money to pay off the euro bond and to pay off our debts. So 
you negotiate, you there will always be structural benchmarks you don't like. Many of them make a lot of sense, but they are not difficult to do. I don't actually deal. I meet the IMF at the beginning of the mission sometimes, and not all the time. I have, it actually doesn't get on my radar. It's Susan, that's why she's gone off. I do the real economy things. Treasury and Central Bank do the uh, macroeconomy things. Uh, we haven't had any problem in terms of implementation. Most of those structural benchmarks have a policy and legal reform nature. They actually are not particularly demanding. Uh, I don't think we have had too many problems so far. But, you know, who pays the piper? That's, that's the reality. And as long as we are in this crisis, that's the situation that you can uh, sort of uh, be heroic like our friends in Ghana and Zambia and draw it out. And then you end up in an even bigger hole that, than you are in the first place. Uh, so you have to be pragmatic about some of these things. Uh, tax, sledgehammer approach. Um, you know, when governments are in a fiscal crisis, one of the things that happen is that the tax system becomes very capricious. Uh, that's the way that uh, the people and they're, they're very aggressive. They are going to the easiest to collect. Uh, I must say that uh, we did actually have time to look at the at the tax, at the tax sort of code very very uh, very very closely uh, in the first year. Uh, it's very capricious. It's very incoherent. Um, but partly, a lot of that also has to do with industry itself. We have a very bad lobbying system coming from even uh, the, uh, the, the, the manufacturers, so that you see one person has lobbied for protection on this, another person has lobbied for something with an opposite effect, and there's not sufficient uh, overarching, uh, overarching view of it all. Uh, I asked uh, the people who do the taxes why they had uh, put one tax here and another one here. None of them could give me a proper answer, and, uh, which makes economic sense. And then you realize that all these taxes have been bought. These taxes have been paid for by someone. So industry is not as innocent as we like, sometimes like to make ourselves. We are, I think that is one of the things that we are going to have to do. There is a tax policy which we found being developed. Uh, it has been adopted by cabinet. I think it needs to be relooked at. So I'm hoping one of the things that we are now able to do, if things is up, is relook at that tax code, come up with a coherent set of principles and policies by which we are going to change that if we do, and also a much more predictable whatever of where tax policy is headed. Uh, but that's that's the legacy that uh, we need to fix, um, as well as being able to rationalize. But coming to manufacturing, I must say that the, 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 I think that there are some things we have to be honest with ourselves about. Our manufacturing industry, as currently structured, is not something that's going to take us very far forward. It is capital intensive, high mar high margin, low volume industry more about making profits for a few people than creating jobs and raising incomes for the vast majority. So I have to say that we have been very explicit that we have to change the structure of the economy towards one which is more uses what we have, which is labor, one which uh, is, creates more jobs, and uh, more competitive. Uh, again, I think uh, we are going to take out a lot of the protection for domestic oriented uh, kind of uh, manufacturing. So if you are not in a competitive, globally competitive segment uh, of industry, you need to start looking at uh, how you can um, restructure. It may not be immediate, but that's the direction that we, we must go. Uh, the co we, we put it very bluntly in our manifesto. We have the highest capital per worker in manufacturing for any country at our level of development. It takes 
10,000 or 10 to 12,000 dollars to create one manufacturing job in Kenya. For the rest of Africa, which is still high, is about $6,000. In South Asia, it's two, one to $2,000. India is $2,000. Bangladesh is $1,000. So if it's taking $10,000 to create a manufacturing job, how much capital do you need to create jobs for all the young people that we are putting in the market? That industry has to change. Of course, there will be adjustment costs. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks, David. I'm sure Job has um, some reactions. So I'll give John a minute. He has a question. And then I'll ask you to sort of make um, quick reactions and we will conclude. And then we can bring it to a close if that's OK. So John. Sorry, I was hoping I'll be the last one to ask, but uh, but uh, since you didn't give me another chance, let me thank all the speakers today. I don't know if you'll get a chance to say that. But uh, let me take you back, David D, to uh, this is a question, a comment on a conversation, but it's directed to everybody on the stage. So it's not necessary to you. And I think Kwame may be in a very good place to answer it. David D, let me remind you how we met. We met in 2003, I believe, you and I. I was around there. Uh, you were then either Kipra or a uh, country member, one of the two, right? Neither, yeah? But we met, we met around that time. And um, that time I was a very innocent investment banker and I'd come to visit from New York. And you sent me some really good research, which I read, very detailed research. And if I may summarize what your research then showed um, was that Kenya has about 15% of its land that's arable, only 15%. And you had a lot of good statistics. And the argument that you proffered then was that actually Kenya should stop. That's what you wrote, or we discussed as well. Should stop investing in agriculture and only invest in processing because I think Tanzania had about 60% of its land was arable, and Uganda was even higher. I think that's what the research showed. And therefore, the argument was that those, let those be the food baskets of East Africa. They do the production, the basic production. In Kenya, we do the processing instead of spending all our money investing in agriculture. Today, you see it at a position we are the chief advisor of the government. And the first big policy advice was to invest heavily in agriculture. Doesn't that go into contradiction of your 2003 research, which as I said, we discussed, you sent me all the research, I looked at it deeply and I agreed with it then. And I've been using it since. Have I been wrong? Is a questioner for you and also for the members on the stage, Maybe Kwame and then David, you can comment. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think, uh, yeah, you've been in this a long time, David. Yeah, so sometimes this time sequencing. No, I'll, I'll go to Kwame first. But yeah, thanks, thanks, John, for that reminder. All right. Um, well, I, I think the first time I also had that argument, I had it from David, um, which is, and I don't think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to provide an excuse, but I'm, I think in 2003 or 2004, um, the idea about structural transformation, which was that Kenya needed to move labor away from farms and into manufacturing, appeared self-evident. And maybe, in my view, what I think I missed was the, that huge hurricane of manufacturing capability that came from China. Uh, which made the manufacturing sector so competitive, it was so, so competitive uh, that in China some, and, in, and the rest of Asia, of course, copied it very, very quickly. Uh, in Nairobi, people won't shake your hands for $200 a month. In those parts of the world, people wake up and work 12 hours a day to want that, that amount of money. So I think that's happened. And it might have been also about one thing that those of us who, who sit here and pontificate on policy say, um, 
governments sometimes aim and miss. Um, that opportunity, in my view, was there. Um, it wasn't taken. Uh, because it wasn't taken, global dynamics have changed. And so perhaps we find ourselves in such a way that we have to perhaps dig deep. But as I conclude, I think Kenya still has a good scope to be the largely manufacturing hub, if I may use buzzwords, for the East Africa region. Um, because I think if you look at Uganda, you look at uh, Tanzania as well, uh, even some parts of South Sudan, there's quite some agricultural productivity, I mean, production that takes place in terms of volumes, but the ability to actually process, ship it, and, and do the kind of packaging that's possible here is, is, uh, is what um, perhaps is the opportunity that's there. Thanks. All right. Uh, Job, and then David. David, I'll come to you last. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one thing I have to note is that uh, we have to preserve what is there existing today. Uh, because when you look at uh, value addition, which brings the essence of uh, the economic ripple effect, it's a question of movement from farming to manufacturing, from mining to manufacturing. That's value addition from pastoralist communities to manufacturing. If we don't preserve the existing manufacturing farms, we will not be able to backward integrate. We'll start from ground zero again. That's why we have to preserve what is there existing so that once we are looking at the production, uh, those farmers, we can be able to uptake the goods that they are making so that they can get the value of their, uh, the value of their sweat. Uh, so, how I would look at is in 2024, we any 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 regulation or any fiscal policy measure that is coming into place that we work collaboratively with the government and ensure that we are doing impact assessments, like fiscal policy impact assessments, so that when it is being imposed through a miscellaneous amendment bill or a finance bill 2024 it is well analyzed so that the ecosystem benefits out of it. Uh, the banking sector is benefiting out of that. The manufacturing sector and other private sector players are benefiting out of that. The government is getting it right due. So that it, through these, jobs are going to be created, investments are going to be created, and we th drive the government agenda of driving the production. But without preserving what is there existing, uh, we may have a very hard start that uh, we that can affect how we progress on uh, for the next uh, 10 years thank you uh thank you job um so a couple of thoughts on the fiscal uh, sort of framework david would you want to wrap it up thank you very much john because that's a provocative question which actually allows me to bring some nuance to what we're saying very important nuance because I think economics is complicated. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's a very difficult subject to actually develop, uh, connect all the dots at the same time. I haven't changed what I said. And I haven't changed what I'm saying. I said earlier that agriculture right now can recovery because, precisely because it does not need new investment. So I am not saying we invest in agriculture. I am saying it's a low hanging fruit that can lead our recovery because we do not have capital or time <laughs> to wait for investments to mature. You can harvest existing trees. Yeah? Good example, coffee. We used to produce 130,000 metric tons of coffee at the peak in 1980, late 80s. We are down to 40,000, 35,000. We still have enough trees to do 80 to 80,000. Because what people do, they neglect the trees, they only pick the cherry, they don't invest, they intercrop with the... But if you can actually uh, give them a better price, they can bring those trees back into production very quickly. 
So because that capital stock already exists. Yeah? So you're saying, what capital stock exists that can lead our recovery? It is in agriculture. But the fundamentals that we are talking about have not changed. So you're not saying we expand. Because we shouldn't be expanding agriculture. That's true. Yeah? So that's how you reconcile that story. But I want to bring another perspective which uh, he has brought about industrialization. We cannot compete with South Asia on the low uh, wage, labor intensive, switch of economy industrialization. That's a fact. Because in Bangladesh, $100 is a good wage. In Kenya, he said our EPZ uh, you know, $250. So we have the wage cost of Turkey and the productivity of Bangladesh. So sweatshop manufacturing, the Asian model is out of question for us. So what is our path to industrialization? If I've asked somebody this question and they've answered it, please keep quiet. Let me ask people in this which is Kenya's largest manufacturing concern? What do you think? Any guesses? Who is Kenya's largest manufacturer? Which one? No, think of, I'm talking about business, enterprise, concern, yeah, single business. ABL? I ask this question and no one gets it. The biggest manufacturing concern in Kenya by far is KTDA. One billion dollar enterprise, 60 manufacturing plants. How many manufacturing plants does EABL have? All right. Um, so, the one thing, if we cannot compete with South Asia on cheap labor, is we can be competitive in agro-processing. Because you are adding value to something you are already competitive in. Yeah? So you are now sort of moving from primary to secondary. Which is why I say dairy. Because we already have the cows, and we have farmers who know how to do dairy farming, which people take for granted. If I give you a cow and you've never sort of done dairy farming today, it will be dead tomorrow. Uh, so because you have that human capital plus the system, uh, all if you increase your dairy and look at the dairy export industry, particularly within FCA, AFCFTA, how do you make dairy products? called manufacturing. <laughs> okay? It's processing. It's a manufacturing. Why did I talk about leather? We've got the raw material. We've got the livestock. Okay? So I'm not saying we invest in agriculture, in the expanding pastoralism. We already off taking 18 million hides and skins. I'm saying we have raw material. That's going to waste. Where do you put that in? Leather. Manufacturing. Production of apparel. Shoes and stuff. Manufacturing. So you're saying, for now, agriculture also provides us the base for industry that we can be competitive in. It will not be as big and it will not drive as economy as much as the apparel industry is uh, driving Southeast Asia. But somebody talked about diversification and resilience. What happens is that we end up with a much more balanced economy. I think for us in terms of the global economy, our real big competitive edge is in services. And we're seeing that. 
Uh, we're seeing a huge interest uh, from uh, the uh, tech industry in, in, in locating here. We're doing quite a bit of that. There's some fairly sophisticated. Uh, even if you look at, uh, we tried many years ago, we thought we would go into um, the call center industry, which is the low end of uh, BPO that uh, the Philippines and India went into. We actually didn't do well at all in that. Uh, what we have done very well in is a very sophisticated, the highest end industry of BPO. It is called SMEs. Those are the guys who write college essays for students in, the, in, 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 in whatever. We are one of the big uh, epicenters, which tells you that your human resource is much more sophisticated. It shouldn't be doing calls. It can be doing more sophisticated work. And so it happens that, in fact, the thing which is interesting companies here, the tech companies we talk to, is things like AI. If you look at the case, there's a famous case in uh, the newspapers uh, between Meta and some workers uh, who are doing content moderation work. That's really the high end, which is more sort of intellectual kind of, uh, of, of content, sort of digital work. We have an animation industry which is growing. We have a very significant uh, translation industry. I met some guy who told me that, in fact, uh, the one of his contracts, one of his accounts, uh, he runs a BPO here, one of his accounts is transcriptions uh, of court proceedings for Singapore. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Of course, we know we have a digital. But what does that tell us? It tells us it's not, there's no silver bullet. I think for us, uh, we have to look at a diversified economy of which agriculture, agro-processing, we remain a critical part. I agree. What then happens, because we have very limited arable land, then we must put it into very high-value agriculture. And that's what we're doing. That's why we have a large exporter of horticulture and flowers. And then we, can, we don't want to, if you can put land in, in hortic export horticulture, it stands to reason that's not where you should be growing maize. So we can let Tanzania grow maize. So the story is still the same. Thank All you. right, well, I think you, I hope you've acquitted yourself, John. Cut your education thing. Okay, listen. US is the single largest exporter of agricultural goods. They don't even count agricultural employment in their employment. If you look at the US labor and employment data, agriculture is not counted because the amount of people it employs is negligible. So as you develop, in fact, exactly what happens is that your agric as agricultural productivity increases, the share of agricultural employment falls. Let me finish. Let me complete. Secondly, how many people per square meter do you employ in agriculture compared to a square in Sir, agriculture and farming are not the same thing. You will employ less people in farming, but you will employ more people in other parts of the value chain. In fact, farming only accounts for 15 to 20% of the agricultural value chain. A lot of the jobs, as I said, I give example of KTDA. It is a manufacturer. But what does it manufacture? It manufactures tea. Green leaf is an input. So what I'm saying, is yes, your labor force will not stay in agriculture because the returns to manual labor in agriculture is very low. But it so happens, in fact, in the direction that agriculture is moving now, 
One of the sectors you see that uh, growing very rapidly in terms of agricultural support services is robotics, automating uh, various things in agriculture. As long as products have a market and there is a uh, productivity. So this idea, the fact that that's an important, as I said, it's an integrated, diversified economy. It doesn't mean that everybody is a peasant with a hoe. Yes, but someone who has been in industry for all his career, 52 years, and having set up a primary industry of making resins, what we have done is created 340 subsidiary companies who are making paint, adhesives, uh, fiberglass items, and a wide variety of it. Someone earlier on said Kenya is perhaps more widely um, spread as far as the industry is concerned. It's because we are already in primary industries, which has created secondary industries, and that has given us a strong economical base. Agriculture is a short-term one. Uh, yes, the processing and so on. I mean, in my own industry, I use 3,000 tons of soybean oil as part of a raw material. But who grows soybean oil in Kenya? We are going to grow soybean oil. Let me also add. Listen, after I'm six feet under the ground. We are doing it. In fact, we are just in the process of procuring soybean seed because we need soybean for livestock feed. But let me add something else. We have only talked about some things. If you look at our five pillars, one of those pillars is housing. Why is pillars a housing? Because we know that as we bring down public works, there is going to be slack in the construction industry. Where is that slack going to go? We want that slack to go into housing because we need housing. What does housing support? Housing supports your industry. Yes. Yeah? Pains. So housing is another sector that we so, see driving manufacturing. So yes. I said it is not either all. It is not it's one sector. Yeah. Yeah. It's a diversified economy okay. and there is a sequencing. Where we are today, we have to start with agriculture because that's where we are. Yeah. I didn't say that's where we're going to end up. Nice. It's a journey. It's a, that's where the potential is. Yes. I, David speaks very passionately, so it's, 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 it's no surprise that uh, you'd have that sort of um, uh, response. But thanks, David. I think uh, we take the point. Um, I'd like to bring it to a close in the midst of that passion. So uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to thank you, especially David, but uh, Nelly will do that for me, uh, for showing up, uh, Job, Kwame, and the rest of uh, those who spoke earlier. Thank you very much. It's been a very uh, fascinating morning. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you for an amazing, dense conversation. Before you leave the stage, this is what we'll do. I know we've already ran over time. I'm going to ask our group managing director to come on stage, at least thank our guest speakers. So we'll start with David. And for those who want to take pictures, Akuna uh, Pesa <laughs> Thank you, Dr. D. This was amazing, amazing, intense conversations today. Almost felt like being back in the University of Nairobi with Dr. Nyandemo. For those who remember him, the next one is for Job Wanjohi Asante Sana from Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Thank you so much, sir. And the final one is for Kwame. Thank you, sir. I will then ask the four of you to remain on stage for a photo op. John, also remain on stage. I will ask Madam Esther Koimet to also join the stage for a photo op before I then ask Raphael to give a vote of thanks to everybody who's been very patient with us today on matters economy, which are very, very trivial to our country. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So thank you. I, I, I think the thanks. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, we've come to an end of a uh, fascinating morning. Um, interesting as it was, and you know some of the things that I, I think David was afraid to go at directly, but it's true. The quality of our debate doesn't show up in GDP at least directly, but it does eventually in terms of what we do. So if it wasn't for you are showing up, we obviously would not have had that debate. So I just want to thank you, our customers who continue to partner with us uh, through this journey and uh, patronize our business every day. Thank you so much for staying throughout the almost three hours. And we're looking forward to meeting you again uh, in the new year. Uh, for exactly the same, same conversation. So thank you, and uh, may you have a wonderful rest of your morning. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Feel free to leave at your pleasure. Asante Nisana. Thank you.